Board members, any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. And there is a board hearing that will be coming up, and then we'll be addressing this at a, another meeting. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business board policies. Uh, board members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Policy 5110, admission. Policy 5460, renumbered as policy 5570, searches. Policy 5500, code of student conduct. Policy 8120, purpose, role, and responsibilities of the Board of Education. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit O. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the Board's Policy Review Committee? Thank you, Ms. Mack. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is uh, unfinished business, superintendent's proposed operating budget. Um, and for that, we call forward Dr. Scrivens, Mr. Harris, and Mr. Tantliff. Thank you. Um, I will uh, just indicate that uh, we have updated the questions submitted by the board, all of which are posted, and we are hoping this evening that uh, with the 30 minutes allotted in your schedule that the board may wish to focus on any amendments and uh, associated motions uh, that will allow us to bring uh, back a final total uh, board proposed budget for the February 25th meeting. Board members, questions, comments? Ms. Mack? <laughs> Mr. Saris, on page 114 of the budget book, the eighth line down shows school counselors, 110 in elementary, 75 in middle, 106 in high school. It also shows 58 in other. Can you provide more information on where those 58 other school counselors are? Did you say 110? 114. 114. Um, unless uh, Dr. Nieves or Zarchin have um, anything to add, that would be something that we would have to look up. Typically, they are either in uh, special programs or they could be itinerant uh, working for a number of schools, but I don't have a specific answer for you. But you can get back to me on that? Yes. Okay. And on that same page, the projected enrollment in the top right-hand corner is 111,269. But on page 18 of the budget book, our enrollment is at 115,038, which is a difference of 3,769. Can you tell me why we show that difference? Or why we have a number that's different here than the number that we often all use, 115,000? I think the difference is programs. Can you explain that? Um, I believe that the uh, numbers on this page are. Um, Those are strictly the numbers that uh, to which the, the ratios on the prior page are applied yeah. in our formula for classroom instruction. And uh, as Whit said, uh, there are programs, stuff, stuff that isn't correct. subject to ratios. So right. does that mean we're providing services for approximately 3,700 students outside of the schoolhouse? Well, they're in the schoolhouse, but they would be programs that are not 
Right. So one of the answers to the board's question dealt with Spark, for example, okay, extended that's what year, I'm trying to get to. And, and that would approximate that number and I think account for most of those, that variance. Okay, Excuse me, Ms. Hen has a yes. footnote oh, that Ms. you can Mack, actually read. Footnote number one explains the what it excludes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Home assignment, <coughs> evening, and special schools. Thank you. I did not see that. Um, board question 123 asked about devices for paraeducators, and staff's response was that BCPS is currently working on a plan regarding paraeducator device access based on input. This could carry a cost of up to $1.5 if there are at most 1,100 paraeducators, why is this total 1.5 million instead of 330,000, which would be 1,100 times approximately $300 for a Chromebook? Um, Jim, do you want to take that? Hey, Mr. Mack, how are you? Hi. Um, so that number is based on um, an understanding of what would be issued to a para. So if pairs were to be issued the same device that a staff member would be issued, it would be about an $1,100 device. If we were to issue a pair of Chromebook, then it would be a much lower cost. But that's why, it, that's why we gave you an upper limit. With, without further input, we haven't been able to narrow down exactly what that device would look like. Okay, so there's no compelling reason that you know of that they would need what a teacher or has. Um, you just gave us the upper limit. So uh, again, based on what, what the need would be. Uh, so if we were to say um, we wanted to mirror what the student interaction would be, for the next uh, year at least, high school pairs would all need to have a PC because that's what the students would carry. Uh, so at the elementary school currently, we have Chromebooks, which would be something that would mirror that. At the middle school, until this budget is passed, we, we have uh, proposed Chromebooks, but uh, again, until those decisions are made, I can't give you a hard number. Okay, so it's somewhere between 330000 and $1.5 million. That, that would be a great estimate, yep. Thank you. Sure. Um, so as part of board member question, staff provided Exhibit 1A, which includes curriculum instruction, digital subscriptions, software licensing fees, and 1B, which is innovative learning subscriptions and software licensing fees. The total FY 2021 projected expenditures for curriculum instruction are 2.6 million. Most of the contracts on 1B are included on 1A, but there are four contracts that are not, and I can tell you which ones they are if you want. Yes, go, go the, ahead. The ARA 21019, JMI 61715. JNI 743.16, JNI 754.16. And then of the four of them, one had expired on January 31st, and that's the JMI 617.15. So my question is, Ms. Hen submitted the, a question. It was the first question on the list of board questions, and it asked for the usage data and usage data was not provided on 1A, it was provided on 1B. Can you help me understand why? Uh, whatever data that the Department of Technology and uh, academics and can extract from the, the uh, software to provide the number of students or hits or licenses that that we have was provided so i don't so uh, is it safe to say then on 1a all of the things listed on 1a we have no usage data for no i don't think i can say that i think that's uh probably something that we'll have to review but i am let me just bring that up. Do you have it? it there's no data in it. Yeah. 
we'll need to check with Mr. Ambriel. And can you get back to me on that? Sure. Um, Could you give us, me the names of those, the numbers of those four contracts again? Yes, ARA-210-19. Right. JMI-617-15. Yes. JNI-743-16. Yes. JNI-754-16. And these are the ones that are they're on, appear on both? No, they're on, they're not on, um, on 1A. Okay. Everything on 1B is on 1A except for these four contracts. Ms. Mack, would you also, do you know the names of those? I know you've given us the contract numbers. Do you name, have the name of the product? Unfortunately, I don't because when I printed those sheets, the products, um, actually, wait a minute. 21019 is um, SIRS researcher. Mm -hmm. SIRS. Yes. Something else. And hold on. Oh my. I'm sorry. I, I don't remember the first. It's there are all three things on the same um, contract. SIRS discoverer, SIRS issues researcher. Yeah, but there's the one above that. Culture grams. Thank you, yes. Ms. Mack, I think on 1A, the column where they have usage listed is what they ha could find data on usage. I, I don't think, hold on. Or in 1B, I mean Yeah, there's no usage K. at all on 1A. On 1B in column K, I believe that's what they had usage data on, but we'll follow up. Okay, and then um, on 1A, we had projected FY20, 2021 expenditures, but we were not provided that information for those four contracts that are on 1B. There was no FY 2021 expenditures on 1B at all. Well, those would be budgeted or projected since we're talking about that fiscal year, right? In other words, there's no actual FY 21 projection or expenditure. Well, there's continued spending on the contract. Okay, that we'll have to determine if that is going to be, con if they're going to continue to use that program, if we can project those for Well, that's you. actually one of my next questions. I only have two more. Um, as previously mentioned above, on the innovative learning sheet, so that's 1B, contract JMI 61715 for class flow shows total <coughs> expenditures of 2762991 which is $12,991 over the contract spending authority. But what's more relevant to this discussion is um, this is a product that we've had since January 2015. We've spent $2.7 million, and there's been no, there's no usage data available, which I find concerning. And I've been told that we have trainers in schools teaching class flow, um, so I would think we ha would have usage data. And then we have a this contract ended January 31st of this year. So if the contract expired do um, does that do you know if the FY21 budget includes any dollars whatsoever for class flow if, if it's not listed on this spreadsheet I do not contracts do expire sometimes they're replaced sometimes they aren't and it may be that uh, curriculum instruction has not planned to replace it or they may be going to rebid it or and and move away from this particular product. So that would be something we'll have to follow up with you on. Okay, and then um, on ARA 21019, and that's the one I think that are the SERS researcher, SERS discovery, right. and the whatever Mr. Embriali just said. Culture Graham. Culture Graham. There's an annual cost associated with those three products of $300,000. Yes. 
yet with the usage provided, all three of them only had 464 views in the last six months. I'm curious, what is the continued justification for funding a product that only had 464 views in six months for an average of $107 per view? I can speak to that, uh, Ms. Uh, Mack. So um, part of the research database for SIRS is um, it provides resources that search for um, um, controversial issues, famous people, uh, countries, states, mm -hmm. animals. Um, so oftentimes the decision is that they may offer uh, research uh, on topics that other uh, databases do not. So I understand your concern is the volume, and what I'm saying is, is some databases offer a unique set of research, uh, research resources. But with a budget as tight as ours, the question I ask is, can we really afford to pay $107 a search? We're going to continue to use right. Ms. Mack. Or a view, excuse me, not a search, a view. And let me clarify, view. I, I just want to clarify the $98,000 on there. That should have been represented one time. That's the cost of all three of those products. Right, and if you divide 98,000 by 464, it's 107. Well, actually, it's 214, but I cut it in half because it's a six-month view. So it's $107 a view. Well, but I want to make sure that we're correct on the cost. It's $98,000 for all three tools. It's the SERS. The SERS package is 98 is the $98,000 right. representative. Right, and I only did the calculation on the 98000 but the contract spending authority is 300000 How many years? Uh, th from 18 through 23. Right, mm -hmm. it's a multi-year right. spending authority. But I, I guess my question still is the same. Given a tight budget situation when we have teachers asking for raises and five bargaining units asking for raises, can we really afford to spend $107 per view, regardless of the level of information that it provides? And that might be just a rhetorical question, so I'm not even asking you to answer it. I do have um, one more question, and Mr. Saris, you'll probably be happy that uh, it's not for you. <laughs> um, with, there have been a lot of discussions, and this was, I sent this question in, and the answer is not going to be for another week or so, but I think it's incumbent upon us to discuss it here because it relates to the budget and it might have budget implications. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the 34 resource teachers, and I am confused about the resource teachers in, specifically in the GTCAC or the Office of Advanced Academics. And the reason I am confused, I attended the meeting where it was acknowledged that there were eight people and seven of them were, were leaving advanced academics, leaving the coordinator, one resource teacher, and an administrative assistant. The weekly update that I asked for in November, a breakdown of resource teachers by department shows seven resource teachers in the Office of Advanced Academics. But the budget shows a total of five, five professionals and one support person. Why is there a discrepancy in that information? Uh, well, um, most of the resource teachers are actually within the schools. So there's a mixture. They may be assigned to the office, but they show up in the budget book under the uh, school allocation. But we had a very extensive meeting last week for the um, GTCAC, and there was nobody, um, there was tons of discussion, and nobody ever said, well, let me clarify that there's only five people. It was acknowledged that there were eight people total, eight resource teachers total, seven were going out of the Office of Advanced Academics, but we don't even have them funded in the budget book for FY21 proposed or FY20 adjusted? Um, the eight are in the office, but they just don't all show up in the office because they're in, some are in the school, up within the resource teacher bucket, some are show, show up in the offices. They may be assigned to the office, but they're still within the school bucket, so to speak, 
but they're still assigned to that office. But they wouldn't show up there. They would show up on the report that uh, you were probably provided by HR. No, actually, I was. Uh, I don't know who provided it, but I asked but specifically eight is the number for they have. eight is the number that HR is showing. Well, no, HR is showing seven. The GTCAC conversation talks about eight, and the budget shows five. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we will have that. Uh, inform we've compiled this information, and it will go to the board on Friday. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I don't have any further questions. Dr. Williams wanted to I just in. want to clarify, um, upon the, the development of the proposed budget, there was extensive conversation about the allocation, particularly around resource teachers. And so we will try our best to provide an answer, but that's the work that this office has been doing to clarify whether it was a grant, whether it was coming out of special ed, whether it was coming out of academics, whether it was coming out of school base. And so we will try our, our best, but Ms. Mack, I think that's the work that it's gonna take us some time because this situation um, just didn't happen this year. This has been years in making of the allocation of resource teacher and the, actually the clear definition of what a resource teacher is. So um, we will provide a response, but I just want to caution the board. This is going to take someone, this is like a puzzle that we're trying to unpack and it's years in the making. <laughs> and so I thank um, Dr. McComas and the community superintendents for being at the GTCAC meeting and trying to respond uh, to respond to those questions about why we had to move some resource teachers back into the school building. So I appreciate those remarks, um, Dr. Williams. At the same time, I can understand Ms. Mack uh, and other board members that may be asking questions, wanting to have them answered because this is the work session where board members are supposed to make uh, any motions or amendments or modifications to the budget before we take the vote in two weeks. So if we don't have sufficient information at this meeting, um, then we may end up needing to uh, make additional ad adjustments at the February 25th meeting. So I think we just need to have that as an understanding as we, as we move forward. I appreciate that, Ms. Causey. I just want to remind the timeline. It's not a timeline that we've created. It's the timeline th that the county created. So in two weeks, we, ha we should have a proposed budget that's going to the county. And so I think at some point, I'm interested in hearing some motions to get some idea of what we may need to do to come back on the 25th with close to a proposed budget uh, for the entire board to approve. Okay, Ms. Rowe, I see you raise your hand. And then I have uh, something to say after that. So on page five of the budget highlights um, that we got last week, That's um, under learning document. accountability and results, there are $6.7 million allocated for Title I and focus schools. And one of the budget questions mentions 10 focus schools. So can you tell me what a focus school is and which schools are the focus schools? And are, are we piloting a new program? What exactly is a focus school? Um, it, right now, that program is 83 of the highest need schools in the district. So that was 1.5 FTEs. Dr. Williams wanted to allocate to each of the 83 schools, which would include all of the Title I schools also, and the schools that are close to being Title I. So the, um, this money is for 10 schools? 83 schools. You said it was the Title I initiative. Maybe we misunderstood you. No, Ms. Rowe, it's which initiative? a focus school. So. I, can, I can clarify. So, um, Ms. Rowe, my understanding is that uh, those teaching positions um, would go towards those schools that are currently identified as Title I, and then the 15 schools that just don't make the cutoff to receive Title I supports. 15 or 10 schools? Uh, uh, 83 schools total yeah, so in that I'll program times 1.5 FTEs each. So is this money an expansion of that program for the 10 focus schools? 
No, the, the referring to them as focus schools is a new uh, expression for us, and the idea is that those are the schools that uh, we recognize that they have a high poverty rate. Their, ho their poverty rate, however, doesn't hit the threshold to actually receive Title I funds, so we want to supplement them with additional resources. Okay, so when it says 10, then that would be the 10 just below the threshold it of may schools. Maybe 10 receiving. elementary, but it's uh, it's more than just 10, I believe, isn't it? That was. Big. It's 83, 83 schools. 83 includes the Title I schools. Yes. Okay, but so there's 10 focus schools that don't qualify for Title I, but they're just above that threshold. Is it because there's only 10 that meet that criteria in the county, or did you select 10, or what are the 10? I'm, I'm not sure. Where are you seeing the 10? On the handout, the flyer. So the sup, the it's between 40, the schools with 48 down. to 55 Learning and accountability farms. and results, there's $6.7 million. I think one of the questions gave the 10. Oh, one of the, an yeah, one of the answers to the questions gave the 10 focus schools. So I just want to know if we're citing 10 focus schools for additional um, allocations, which 10 schools these are, and are we, are, is, is there only 10 in the county that we're doing this for, or are we doing, I'm confused as to. So I do not have the list of those 10 schools that just missed the Title I threshold in front of me. Um, and it is a differentiate support, so not all schools would be receiving that. It would be those 10 that just missed the cutoff for receiving Title I funds. Okay. The idea is a tiered system of support so that we know schools that are impoverished, the, the most impoverished schools, of course, receive the supplemental f Title I funds. Mm -hmm. Schools that also are impoverished, but not impoverished enough to receive the federal funds, would then get some supplemental support. Okay, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Um, Ms. Kazi, yes. are, are we doing everyone's question first and then motions, or? Motion. Because Please. I have two motions, I'm happy to, I don't feel like more questions are gonna add or take away from them. Certainly. Okay, so. Um, my first motion is uh, an amendment I'm calling uh, pay equity, and I move that BCPS amend the current budget so that employees who are not represented by bargaining units be ineligible for pay increases that are greater in percentage than the increase given to the bargaining unit which is given the least percent increase. Percentage increases may be averaged across the bargaining unit for that year to determine the average percent increase and added to COLA increase to establish a maximum percent increase allowable for employees not represented by a bargaining unit. Current terms of employment contracts and legally mandated increases in the minimum wage take precedence over this motion. And if I may speak to that motion. Second. Oh, second. Second. Okay, so if I may speak to that motion, one of the things I noticed when going through um, salary increases across multiple sections of the budget book is that we have various departments where maybe you have four, five, one, two, three um, people who work in that office some of them may be represented by bargaining units, some of them are not. But it seems like the percent increase in wages can be anywhere from 1% to 7%. And to me, it seems like it's, when I look at the, even the incomes, some of our positions, if the same, impact, uh, the same income, if that position existed in the government sector doing almost exactly the same thing, those employees would make half the amount of money that they're making in the school system. And so to also have um, our hardest working in the schoolhouse people who are begging for even the smallest raises, I feel like people who 
aren't represented by bargaining units are somehow getting much higher incomes and much higher raises than some of our hardest working people in the schoolhouse. So I feel that tying um, those staff who are the highest paid in our county and not represented by bargaining units to the pay increases that our bargaining units get creates a, an equitable situation that will discourage unjustified wage inflation. Are there uh, board member questions or comments related to Ms. Rowe's motion? We're going to try and keep it tight to Robert's rules of order with speaking to a motion no more than twice and for, you know, a minimum amount of time that's necessary. Ms. Hen? So, um, looking at the data itself and Ms. Rowe's motion, um, this equates to approximately $9 million and, and again, I rely on our experts to give us the exact number, but in terms of um, an increase of, say, 2%, using that as an example, um, if we were look to look at non-represented or I should say non, looking at non-school-based um, increases across the system, those, if we were to look at the difference between a 2% increase and the increases that this budget re represents, we'd be looking at a difference of roughly $9 million. And that $9 million redirected to, as, as Lily said, um, whether it be teacher pay, administrator pay, um, these, are, these are choices that this board needs to make. And it's why I'm supporting her motion, because I do believe um, there are some inequities that we need to address as a board. We heard from our bargaining units tonight. Um, teacher retention especially is a major crisis facing not only the system, but facing our nation. We are attracting fewer and fewer teachers, and we are losing teachers at an alarming rate. And we need to address that through pay. And this is one way that we do so. So it's why I'm supporting this motion. Mr. Kuhn. So I just have a question so that I fully understand the impact of this. So are you talking about <clears throat> what we approve or what the eventuality of the budget looks like once the county executive and the county council approve and manage or cut or whatever they do to the budget? So. The idea is that, let's say, with what happened last year, um, one of the two of the bargain units were not given anything until later. So our employees who are not represented by bargaining units would, the max amount of pay increase they could get would be whatever the average that the bargaining unit that got the least would get. Based on what's ultimately approved. Okay, thank you. Ms. Joes and then Mr. McMillian. So I don't know if this is a question for you, Dr. Williams, or for uh, Mr. Saris. What are the number of employees that are not part of a bargaining unit? So we have 16,383 employees. 123 are not part of a bargaining unit. And um, for, I, th I want to say almost all of those 123, they currently mirror, uh, the any cost of living ar raise that's, uh, negotiated by either CASE or ESPBC. So, uh, for instance, this year, uh, neither uh, case did not get a cost of living adjustment, and so about half of the about 62 of of those non-represented employees did not get a cost of living adjustment, and most of the remainder got uh, the two percent uh, or two percent for ESPBC. Uh, that will, um, uh, that, that ESPVC got. 
So that's colas, but what about just raises? The, the only raises that occur are step increases and colas, which as Mr. Saris mentioned, mirror the bargaining units. So there's, we talked about this last time, there, there's no, there is no one on staff getting any raise that is any different than generally what you're proposing, the lowest of the collective bargaining units. And one other thing to mention, of the unaffiliated employees, almost half are administrative assistants, senior executive assistants, et cetera. So 68 are executive directors, directors, chiefs. So it's a great motion Point of then. order, uh, Mr. <laughs> Offerman had his, I'm what? sorry, Mr. Um, so it's a good motion, had his then. hand up. It's, uh, it's a good it's motion. Speaking. There's nothing. It's not no going to generate no $9 million. It, it actually wouldn't so. generate any revenue at all. Excuse me, we had a point of order call. So Mr. McMillian had his hand raised, so we're going to turn the floor over to you, Mr. McMillian. Ms. Rowe, would this include trip ways, adult, additional adult assistance in the school buildings that aren't represented by bargaining units? Well, sure, but I believe, are they making minimum wage presently? Because they're going to get increases just by virtue of minimum wage increases, which in my motion I didn't include that because the, the state has increased the minimum wage. And I have a question. Mr. Tantliff. Uh, just one clarification. The um, additional assistants are not FTEs and they're not in bargaining units. So uh, Ms. Rowe is correct. Right now they're um, rising as the minimum wage eventually makes its way to $15 an hour over the next few years. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Thank you. So I guess I'm still trying to understand what impact would Ms. Rowe's motion have on, I guess it would be these 183 people who are not in a bargaining unit? There would be no financial impact versus what's currently occurring, but possibly it would be a control in the future over a situation that it would ensure, I guess, that that happens, but that is what is actually happening. So it's already happening right now, and there would be no financial impact if this motion there, were to There's pass. none that I see. Do you see any, George? No, in other words, it, it would The budget would be exactly the same. It would be exactly the same. Yeah, the we same. built that in to the numbers that you have. <laughs> Ms. Hen and then Ms. Mack. Okay, so Mr. Tantliff, then maybe you can help us understand or gain a better understanding then of the salaries and wages category. If there are expenses that are not obvious on the surface that are included there, because what we're seeing is a percent increase that's significantly higher than what would be expected um, based on COLAs and steps for central offices. Um, it's a um, department by top. Department by department analysis. So in the questions, there were set numerous departments with that question that we answered. So there's two different things that happen. One is if you compare actuals to budget anywhere, it'll look like a larger increase because there's always going to be some vacancies. So that will make it appear that there's a higher increase. If new positions are added anywhere, and you don't take that into account, and you're just taking salaries 21 versus salaries 20, well, any new positions are going to be included in the 21, as well as COLAs and STEPS. Since, er, since um, the units we're talking about got a June 30th 2% COLA, mm -hmm. they didn't get anything in 20, that looks in the budget book like a 2% COLA because there's no overlap in 20, right? It looks like it's a 2% 21 COLA, of course, if, if you're talking about TAPCO, they had it all year, so that overlap doesn't exist. Um, there's a 1% COLA baked into the scenario, and there's a step increase. So for all bargaining units in the budget book, everyone has the same FY21 assumptions applied to them. There's a modest COLA and a step, plus any overlaps from FY20. Now, once all the collective bargaining is done, things may look a little different, but that's what's in the budget right now. So, and, and the vacancy makes sense. So the, the examples I'm thinking about, the headcount is flat, so there are no increased positions, so those are taken out of the equation. 
Um, Office of Visual Arts, let me give you an example. The FY19 actuals were 202,000. The FY20 budget, 302,000. For two professional positions, no support staff positions for an increase of 49%. Is that an example that you had mentioned of a vacancy um, or how do, what, to what do you attribute? It, that increase most likely that would be the case but I'd have to go look if it's a question we answered I mean I don't know them all off the top of my head but that's the only um, plausible explanation if you had one position vacant for half a year you only have two people that's a quarter of the whole budget and and that makes sense and but the answers that were provided to the board were what you had just said that the COLA and steps were the response and that doesn't add up so I'm I'm asking for greater clarity I think we did look though if a position got added we said it was due to positions call us step vacancies so I these mean, were the responses so that's that were gonna just be provided. in the spreadsheet that okay. we're working on now the 57 okay. instances of that okay. and the ex explanation will be along those same lines the difference between actuals of 19, the budget of 20, and the budget of 21 are going to show a lot of disparity because the actual expenses are going to include vacancies and other changes in incumbency and compensation and so forth. But the rates are the same. Okay. And there aren't any other expenses that would not be obvious on the surface that we're not thinking about when we look at these numbers and that sh we should be taking into consideration. Um, these are pure, what uh, you see is what you get, salaries at, for at these a, positions. At, at a specific office, there could be something like they um, took some uh, non-salary dollars and budgeted for a contractual employee or a temporary, <laughs> you know, a contractual employee. Um, there might be new types of EDAs that maybe um, someone in CNI is supporting, but je but that's not a material part of this discussion. But I'm just saying there could be things other than an FTE that could have a small impact at a very granular level, not at a macro level. Okay, so you see Ms. Rowe's motion as more of a control rather than a fiscal impact on this budget in terms of if we support it. Yes, that's how I, I see it. Thank you. Board members, any other questions or comments? Um, I just want to state that I'm going to support the motion, I think, as a control and as a um, statement by the board in terms of equity pay. I think that, um, I think that it's a good idea. Anyone else? All in favor? Okay. I'd like but for you to just reiterate the control to reiterate the control piece, as a control, what does that mean to you? Um, uh, well, Ms. Rowe's motion was basically saying the lowest increase of any bargaining unit mm -hmm. that's agreed to collectively would be what applies mm -hmm. to all unaffiliated employees. So if there were, and many years everyone gets the same cost of living, but if there was one, you know, let 20 would be a good example. Um, if one bargaining unit got 2% and another one got 1%, unaffiliated employees could get no more, would get the 1%. Now, I understand clearly what she is suggesting, but you're saying, or you said, that right now it's there, that it's happening anyway. So when you talk about controls, control over what? Are you talking about a control next year, year after next, et cetera? I just need that articulated so I get what the word control means in terms of the motion. If right now we have the situation in play, I, what does that mean? I think it's giving the board confidence that that will always occur. Okay. You're essentially memorializing that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All in favor of Ms. Rose's motion, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstained? The motion fails for lack of a majority. Um, 
I'm sorry. That's right. Because of the student uh, member of the board does not vote on budget six counts, so the motion carries. Thank you. Um, Should I do my second motion, or do you want me to wait for that? Um, I had a motion that I wanted to put forward, and I have a handout. Could you pass this along? Thank you. Um, I move that staffing for the Office of Advanced Academics be restored to that which is shown on page 250 of the fiscal year 21 proposed budget book. One coordinator, one administrative assistant, and four resource teachers at a minimum. The financial impact is neutral because it's already proposed in the book. Need a second. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a motion. Is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Mack. I'm going to speak to my motion. The financial impact is neutral because it was already reflected in the original proposed budget book. Also, we have heard significant uh, feedback from our Gifted and Talented Citizens Advisory Committee that has worked extensively for years. Um, and the uh, issue is that while we transition to more school-based resources, um, it will be helpful to, as the GTCAC president said, um, that we have this right now um, very experienced group in Gifted and Talented, and they can support the growth of the professional development of those school-based academic advancement facilitators. Uh, this staffing will support the MSDE Maryland's Gifted and Talented Student Identification Model to identify 10% of all grade three students in the school system, identify the top 5% of grade three students in every school in the school system based upon the state mandated assessments in mathematics and English language arts. Um, it will also be able to allow them to document advanced learning behaviors in pre-K through two and multiple measures from the list of MSDE approved assessments and checklists to identify additional students. Um, so for those reasons and the many, many more that were articulated in the emails and the comments that were given to us by GTCAC, I would appreciate your support of this motion. Board members, questions or comments? Mr. Kuhn. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Kuhn just raised his hand. Ms. Mack seconded the motion. Mr. Kuhn. So my question about these resources is where are they slated to go now? Are they going into schools to provide, or provide actual hands-on work with children or I'm, I don't know what they're, I guess maybe Dr. Williams or someone. Yeah, I'm happy that. to answer that. So all of the resource teachers, regardless of what office that they were uh, reduced from, um, will follow the priority teacher transfer process. And in that process, uh, they have several options. So uh, they can be, um, a principal can hire them to be a classroom teacher. They can also, they're still within the timelines that if they so choose, they could apply um, and go through the process to pursue becoming a staff development teacher. Uh, they're still within the timeline to apply and pursue the opportunity of becoming a consulting teacher. They're still within the timeline to apply and pursue being a department chair, which would also be at a school level position. And they also are still within the window of time to apply and pursue being an assistant principal. So the answer is they're not um, taken directly from a singular office and directly placed at a particular location. They would be interviewing with principals for school-based positions or they would be interviewing for those other opportunities. So just to follow on, um, this decision was made for a reason and they are coming out of the GT or the advanced academics area. So. Can you describe the decision making to, is, is it just to add them back to the classroom? I mean, you, know, you, you named a number of opportunities sure. for them, mm -hmm. but 
Yeah, so um, certainly the overall concept was to reduce the central office resource uh, teachers and to increase then those positions, those FTEs then become reallocated back to school-based positions. Um, in terms of how we discerned uh, where cuts were made, cuts were made from virtually every single office within CNI. There's only a few offices, uh, for example, that were not cut. ESOL was not cut. Uh, the four resource teachers that we have in central office that actually are teachers of record for the students in the detention center, they were not cut because they actually serve students directly. Um, and so um, what we do is we went through and looked at what is the work and how do we reallocate that work. A huge piece as um, both our president of the GTCAC spoke to and our board members spoke to, a lot of the work that our uh, GT um, resource teachers do is go out and provide professional development. When I looked at the work that our resource teachers do in, in the offices um, and in that office in particular, uh, a lot of it is going out and providing professional development to teachers um, and to faculties. Uh, that work would then be picked up at the building level by our staff development teachers next year who would be who would receive monthly professional learning on uh, all the unique qualities and characteristics of gifted learners, uh, some of the um, topics that we have been, um, that are particularly important is how to appropriately differentiate for the gifted learner, uh, how to provide social emotional learning supports for the gifted learner, as well as how do we recognize and ensure that students who are twice exceptional receive supports both for their giftedness as well as for any learning disadvantages that they may have. Um, in addition to um, the work that they provide at schools um, around the screening and identification process, that is where now um, what we currently have and what would be different in next year is we currently have at each school um, and I'm an, an academic um, facilitator. I'm, I'm missing a letter in that acronym, but every school has, academic thank you, advance, yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's been up since 4.30, so. Um, but right now we have one person who does that as building. By building the capacity of our staff development teacher, we are actually working to develop a team uh, to champion gifted uh, learning at each school as opposed to their sort of being individual people who get support through consulting. You know, our resource teachers go out and provide consulting service. Um, and now we're trying to build a team that lives in the school, knows the students, and can support the classroom teacher someone who's right down the hall as opposed to I need to uh, wait maybe a day or two or a week until they can come out to my school. So that's part of how we're reallocating the work. So Ms. Joes and then Ms. Rowe and then Ms. Scott. Thank you. So what was the reasoning for moving the GT teachers out of central office? And I distinctly remember this board making a huge push for moving central office staff out into the schoolhouse. <coughs> And now I see I find a resistance to it as well. So can you explain what the reasoning was to move these teachers out um, into the schoolhouse? And I think you explained some of it, so I might be redundant. Uh, but what motivated you guys to make that move? Well, let me try to respond. I'm sure Dr. Um, McComas will respond as well. So a part of my 100-day entry plan and the visits, the, the, the recurring issue was around the conditions for success. And so the thinking was, when I looked at the residency model, which was a good response in terms of what the system was trying to do, the sustainability in a school building was a question in terms of folks coming in for two weeks, leaving, going to another school, going to another school, and eventually circling back. So the model, in order to do this, the model was to look at elementary school, as Dr. McComas talked about, having a group in the building to provide that support to our staff and to focus on the learning. So that would be the principal, assistant principal, the staff development teacher, the reading specialist, and the math lead or math resource teacher at an elementary school. So that's the, that's the group that would be providing support in their own building. Hence, we have developed a goal three of the workforce, de um, workforce improvement and human capital. And so we're front loading the professional development during the summer so staff members can go back and start providing that support within a school building. Um, the secondary, we've had um, the uh, principal, assistant principal, or since the principals, 
based on a secondary level, and a stat teacher. But we also had positions called department chairs. Those are the content specialists. They know their content. And we wanted to free them up to provide that support and coaching in a school building. Unlike the residency model, folks would come in. Again, great model at the time. I'm looking at sustainability. So how do we build that capacity? Well, we have to give them that opportunity to work with their teams uh, within a department or the, or the middle school team leaders to work with their grade level to provide support to those, to those staff members in terms of coaching, looking at the instructional program. So the model is shifting instead of it's coming from the central office and we're rotating from school to school, we're trying to put the professional development in the school building and I really want to build that sustainability by building the capacity of those individuals, whether it's elementary or secondary. So have those schools been identified and is it going to be really targeting the schools that have not as much gifted and talented students, you know, in terms of equity, there's schools that have a huge percent of gifted and talented, some schools don't. So what kind of schools would be targeted? Well, this model is for all of our schools. So we're doing, we're shifting to have this model in our elementary and our secondary schools. In terms of special ed, we're having training around special ed. We're going to have training around advanced academics slash GT. We'll still have the GTAA facilitator extra duty assignment. So we'll still have that piece, which is the compliance and paperwork. This is around about instruction. It's about instructional leadership and using key people in the building to provide that on a regular basis. Thank you. Ms. Rowe, and then Ms. So, Pastor. Um, Ms. McComas. And then Ms. Pastor. okay, thank you. It sounded to me in your description like basically these um, resource teachers that were um, accessing those positions and then they have to find their own position within the system or somewhere else but I didn't hear in the list of positions and maybe I missed it can these resource teachers from the central office not apply to be um, development teachers in the schoolhouse no they can they are still within the window to apply to be okay. staff development teachers but if they don't find an opening within the school system the position is accessed and they don't work for us anymore is that what you're no, saying no they will definitely find work? a position within our school system they are employees um if if and, and these typically are uh, professionals who as um uh, Ms. miller Brute spoke to their expertise and uh, whether they're a resource in GT or a resource from any other content office, uh, they've demonstrated that they have strong expertise. They are um, sought after professionals at the building level as well. Ms. Scott and then Ms. Pasteur. Yeah, so I, um, it sounds like you kind of answered this, but I mean, that was my question as far as the level of support. And it sounds like the level of support will be at a school-based level as opposed to being from central office, which is something that I have heard this board talk a lot about, um, having more teachers and resources in the schoolhouse itself as opposed to everything coming from um, the central office. Um, and am I understanding correctly that the, res um, the resource teachers, that they can apply to any school that they would like to? Um, okay, so it's not like they're being sent to certain schools. They can apply anywhere in the system. Okay, and then, um, so I think what the concern is is that there's maybe a void or something, like if you have them all leave, then there's gonna be like a void left here. How, how I, maybe you could speak to that. What will happen? Sure, will so um, we will still have our coordinator of advanced academics, uh, Mr. Kern, and we will also have another resource teacher as a support. Mr. Kern will be working with, across our other academic offices to build capacity within the academic offices. So uh, our math team will grow their capacity around gifted learner. You know, part of this idea, um, you know, if we are shifting resources from a, a 
central model to push them out to schools to build strong teams at schools that live in schools and support capacity at schools, we have to also shift our model at the, at the top. And so really what we're doing is working to uh, ensure that it's not in isolation or a silo, that Mr. Kern alone is not the only person responsible uh, for gifted um, capacity. Um, and so that is going to be a shift because we have thus far sort of really kind of worked in lanes, if you will. Um, and so that will require us to, to engage um, Mr. Kearns in building capacity in the math office and the ELA office um, so that Again, it's building a broader capacity across the board. No one office can carry that work. I think when we think about the disparity in our numbers of students who are under-identified for gifted education, I think that really reflects um, uh, not only that, that we need to take a different approach, but I think it, it reflects um, the downside of working in silos unintentionally. And I think, you know, we've put, and our community is very um, committed to our gifted learners, and I respect and commend the work that they've done over the years to build that office uh, back up. And so uh, while I know that this um, feels very uh, disrespectful to that work, the, the intent here is to, again, build strong teams at schools so that schools have capacity around gifted learners and that we break out of a silo and we really cross-develop uh, the central team so that all of us are responsible for gifted learners, just as every one of us is responsible for special needs learners. Ms. Pesture? Yes. Okay, I'm not real sure whether I'm addressing your motion. I'm just throwing this out in terms of the whole concept. And as Dr. McComas just said, um, and I know that that area, that office was built up. And it's been built in the last few years because it really was not happening, I'm going to say, seven, seven and a half years ago, because you had to get on a schedule to get someone to come in and work with your GT students. When I go to the GT meeting, I hear um, some of the problems, the concerns, et cetera, um, that still exist. So the idea of having that team in a building and there being in every building, operative word here, every building, that in every building, not just in schools that have GT, because every school is supposed to have GT, but we know that sometimes we fall into a deficit of being able to identify children who really are GT. Some of them are not easy to love. Some of them have other things on their plates, and they don't get identified like children who have either a personal history or family issue, uh, history of being in GT. So we miss some. So having a team certainly offers an opportunity to delve into that and to take a look at students who are receiving special education services who are still GT children. Having a team also says that we know how to look at children and, and, and assess whether they are GT or their AP or their honors three different groups of children with different needs, different characteristics. However, I wonder who the people are for real who are going to work with them. So I can see that in that advanced academics office, there needs to be a body of people still who are able to form them. Because I might, not, I might be an English person and not a math person, but I can count that 34 people from around the county, and I thank you, Dr. Williams, for having that conversation with me and actively listening. But I know that when people get an opportunity to interview at different places, I can, through my history, tell you where they won't interview. And it's 34 people. And, and those schools that are 
disenfranchised and lacking now, where those schools and the staff members are struggling to make excellence happen when we start counting, not under your tenure, but in the past, how many? We're going to hold principals accountable for how many AP teachers programs they have and GT programs they have. And we have those children in all of our schools. So I would want to make sure that I would like to see that blend, to have those people sitting in an office somewhere. But what they do is slightly different because they are working with that team. They are working now with, instead of calling the person a stat teacher, we're calling them professional developers. And we're looking at the administrators who might need support and training as well. So I love that concept of in the school because we are going to be able to pump our very best out of our teachers therefore out of our children. But they need um, that crew that's, if you will, that's going to be able to help them in all areas. And because we, we've said at those meetings, because you're GT in one area doesn't mean you're automatically GT in everything. So we need those people in those curricular areas to do that. I don't want us, I love the idea, but I don't want us to throw that baby out with the water, but we do have to spread some of them out. So I guess what I'm saying is maybe the number is not the whole number, but some that can work with the person who's in charge to real. I want to see that plan. I want to know that all of the schools, the Woodlawns and the Randalls towns and the middle schools that feed into them that all of the schools are going to end up on a level playing field with this concept and not left out because they've been left out. <laughs> Ms. Joes? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pestor, for putting so eloquently what I was trying to say. My point is every child in Baltimore County is gifted and talented, and everybody should get that opportunity regardless of what school they go to. So when those resource teachers get to pick, are they going to pick schools that are disenfranchised? The Woodlawns, like she said, are they going to pick those schools? That's where I want to see the gifted and talented school uh, program develop, not just in the Perry Halls and the Herefords, but the truly, truly disenfranchised communities, because every child is gifted and talented. Uh, so that was my concern, and I think she explained it excellently. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Scott, sure. Um, just one more question, just to follow up on that. Um, I guess this would be for Dr. McComas or Dr. Williams. Um, how, if they're going out and they're choosing which schools they go to, previously with the central model, they supported, I guess, all schools. But if they're now being housed at individual schools and we still have schools where it may be lacking or disenfranchised and not have gifted and talented, how are those schools going to get supported if it's not a central office model where it supports all schools? Right. So that is where we come back to the importance of our staff development teacher. So our staff development teacher's job is to provide professional learning for all of the faculty um, and members of a school. Our, our staff development teachers will begin receiving monthly professional learning on gifted learners. And so if I were a staff development teacher at your school, and you are a teacher, I'm going to go and get my monthly professional learning around gifted learners, gifted education, and I'm going to come back to my school, and I will, would work with my principal to then provide that professional learning for every teacher in our building. But you know, do you see how that could be a deficit, whereas if you've had somebody who's already been in that gifted and talented office and already has years of that, and they're taking that to this school, and then I'm brand new, and I'm at this school, yeah. and I'm Cer getting up to speed. Sure. Certainly those who have been involved in uh, gifted um, professional learning um, have an advantage over those who are new to that. The, the really, what I need everyone to understand is the difference in, in numbers here. Because when we think about seven experts, and they are wonderful professionals, seven experts to 175 schools. Staff development teachers, I have one per school. So I have 175 professionals who, you're right, may have a learning curve. But they can learn, 
and and then they can be responsible for disseminating that capacity within their own school. Now, I certainly am not here to disparage the expertise that our resource teachers have because many of them have had a passion for gifted learning and have really um, pursued learning about um, giftedness over years. Um, and so I won't uh, dis argue that. But I will tell you firsthand as a principal, having someone in my building who is a professional developer who can learn and then can help me teach the other members of my faculty month after month after month, I think is a valuable resource. Dr. Williams? Let me just um, clarify. What we're trying to do is build the instructional leadership team in every school. Just like we would have reductions, those folks who were f former assistant principals, former GT, former staff development, you know, th they bring a certain skill set that, of course, all schools. But the, the ultimate model is to really look at every school and to really build the instructional leadership team at every school. Um, so, so that's what we're trying to build, to really look at why our students aren't learning, how do we close those gaps, and those students that are learning, how do we accelerate, how we give them opportunities. So I just want to add that to what Dr. Um, uh, McComas was just sharing, is really building, and that was the message to the principals at their monthly leadership development team was about you can't do this work in isolation, you have to collaborate and to define what is that instructional leadership team, what should it look like, how are you going to build the capacity, how do you front load the learning for everyone and front load the, the, the planning for the upcoming school year. But the point was well taken about um, looking at this different model and the questions and concerns that were Can raised. that be done though with Kathleen's motion? Can we do that with her motion and still do the training and development and everything that, that you're talking about? It we're doesn't. Going to, we're going to proceed, whatever I get, we're going to proceed with looking at training or at the school building. So whether it's a dollar or a million dollars, that needs to happen. We're not going to see gains across all 175 schools, centers, and programs until we invest in building the capacity at the school level. And I, I would just like to s speak to my motion, and then uh, I am going to um, have the vote because we, I know there's a number of other issues that board members want to address, and we need to, um, you know, understand that we have staff here and we need to um, move through this. Um, the, the, the points here are very well made. I appreciate everyone's comments. And what my motion addresses is that we have accumulated specific knowledge in the GT office. And so I am asking that four resource teachers remain for this year. And it can be evaluated next year whether they're not needed. But when we're talking about building the staff development uh, resource teachers, the advanced academic facilitators are also teachers of record. So this will allow, in my opinion, in conjunction with the GTCAC, to train the trainer model in a faster way, to get that GT knowledge from the resource teachers at central office out into the schools so that the learning curve is shorter for this coming year for training the trainer model because I believe in that model. I believe uh, the direction that Dr. Williams is headed. Um, in this case, I just think we should be more um, uh, deliberate in how we make that change this year. So, um, Ms. Pasteur. All right, just to uh, Ms. Causey's point, and I appreciate that you shifted to four, um, and, and that we still are working to that school model, because that's the only way that we're going to make a change. And in four, I would just like consideration to possibly processing <clears throat> with the four. See, I, I'm thinking. Northeast and Central and North, and each one having an area and they are part of the team because they can be instrumental in the teaming. That's what four will do and their focus is a little different but the schools in each area know that they have a person to whom they may go to get assistance and you are building that team in the school and that as you're processing, 
your processing, whoever, because we know, and we've heard people around this table saying that not all stat teachers are equal. So I know that means that in each school, principals get the opportunity to make possibly new decisions about who that instructional, who will comprise that instructional leadership. So thank you for going to four, because that's Thank you, so I'll just repeat number. my motion and then we'll take the vote. Staffing for the Office of Advanced Academics be restored to that, which is shown on page 250 of the fiscal year 21 proposed budget book, one coordinator, one administrative assistant, and four research teachers. It was already seconded. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstain? One abstention, the motion carries. Thank you. Board members, who's next? Ms. Mack. Okay. Um, I move to amend the proposed budget for FY 2021 to reflect that all employees represented by bargaining units, including Tabco Case, ESPBC, AFSME, and OPE, receive a 2% COLA. Second. Would you like to speak to your motion, Ms. Mack? I think quite a few people tonight spoke to my motion, um, but I will say this, we're talking about a $2 billion budget, and if we don't retain our staff, we won't need a board, we don't need a superintendent, we don't, we don't need um, curriculum. If we don't have teachers, if we don't have people in the schoolhouses, if we don't have bus drivers, um, if we don't have paraeducators, then none of us is needed, so um, I think my motion stands for itself. Board members, and if we could just really keep it quick. Thank you, Ms. Rowe and then Mr. Kuhn. I just wanted to speak to my second that it seems to me only fair that if state employees are getting to 2% COLA this next year, that our school system could at least do that. Mr. Kuhn. So, so my question goes to the fiscal impact. Um, if I have that. Okay, great. And in the second part, and I, I can't wait to hear that. Um, but, but more importantly, um, to uh, Dr. Williams, if, if we're increasing the budget by this much, and uh, no, never mind, just give me the numbers, please. Um, at 1%, you're, um, it was 8,931,124, so at 2%, it would be 17,862,240. Any other board members, questions or comments? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously, thank you. Should I keep going? Sure. I move to amend the proposed budget for FY 2021 to reflect that all TABCO represented employees who have reached step 30 receive a $2,000 longevity bonus. Second. You wanna to speak to your motion? Um, I will say that We've talked about it tonight, we talk about it a lot, um, that we have a teacher shortage and we need to retain the knowledge. We just talked about it with the GTCAC teachers. They have knowledge. Our um, experienced teachers have the knowledge that we need to share with our new teachers and perhaps ameliorate the situations that occur in classrooms that make new teachers leave. So I think we need to recognize the value that experienced teachers have, we need to keep them so that they can help us keep our new teachers. Mr. Kuhn, you raised your hand. I was just, how much does that cost? 864,000. Thank you. Board members, questions or comments? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries unanimously. I move to amend the proposed budget for FY 2021 to reflect that all case represented employees who have reached step 20 receive a $1,000 longevity bonus. Second. <laughs> Gosh, okay. I'll take it. <laughs> Would you like to speak to your motion? Um, again, I can't imagine being in a job and I think somebody spoke to it that were promoting principals earlier, so they reach 20 years earlier, and then they go the rest of their careers and not get any type of increase. Um, I think um, 
case represented employees play a very critical role in our schools mm -hmm. and the financial impact of this is only $58,000. Board members, discussion? Ms. Joes and then Mr. Saris. <laughs> what was the fiscal impact again? $58,000. And do they not get any COLA increases after the 20 year period, Mr. Saris? They would. Uh, is that well, the limit? The call is just step. Yeah, they would. Callers are not impacted, they just steps are. Um, yeah, they would max out on steps, but they would still be eligible for a COLA. And I just want to define the term bonus because a bonus One, is right. different than adding, permanently adding that increment. And that's why I stressed bonus. Okay, so it is a true bonus that'll apply just for FY21. Right, because okay. I, I thought we heard that there are some discussions about structuring things and perhaps that will care for that on a going forward basis. I'm just addressing the immediate need to recognize people for the job they do as a bonus. I did just want to say that Mr. Hart, um, excuse me, Mr. Tom DeHart from um, the executive director of CASE just spoke this evening to the issue that COLAs don't always even cover the consumer price index, uh, uh, so the actual cost of living. So, um, you know, so that's an issue. I'm almost finished. I move oh, that in. Excuse oh, me. Oh, sorry. We need to sorry. vote on that one. <laughs> it's getting late. All I'm sorry. in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, the motion carries unanimously. I move that in the proposed budget for FY 2021 that BCPS provide paraeducators with devices and that the money for these devices be included in the budget being presented to the county executive non-transferably for any other purpose. Um, I have spoken to para- Excuse me. Oh, we need a second. Oh, sorry. I'm moving right along here. Sorry. Do I have a second? Mr. McMillian's a second. Thank you. Some of the concerns I hear from paraeducators are that they are a critical um, member of the team. In fact, in the curriculum committee meeting, when we ask about how staffing was done with special education split between teachers and paraeducators, the comment was they are a critical part of our team. And if they're a critical part of our team who needs to have access to email, who needs to be able to communicate with the teachers with whom they work, or even documenting information about students, I think it's only reasonable that we would provide them with some type of device. And the financial impact, as you heard us discuss earlier, could be anywhere from 330,000 to 1.5 million, depending on the level where the paraeducator is and what type of device they're provided with. Board members, is there a discussion around this motion that has a second? Ms. Joes. Mr. Saris, can you explain uh, what that entails, that motion? Because I know there's the, these very same board members are trying to cut down devices. So now we have $1.5 million in devices going out. And where is that money coming from? Uh, the money will be uh, included in our request for local county funds. Uh, as of now, we have a pretty good estimate of our state funding for next year. So any additions that uh, are made tonight will will move the request uh, from Baltimore County government that much more over maintenance of effort. Board members, questions or comments? Can you restate your motion and then we're going to take a vote? I move that in the proposed budget for FY 2021 that BCPS provide paraeducators with devices and that the money included in the budget being presented to the county executive non-transferably for any other purpose. All in favor, raise your hand. Can I make, I'm sorry to do this. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Nussbaum. Is the non-transferable part of the motion I, mean, I just need to make sure that everybody understands that that's not binding on the county. In other words, once it goes over to the county, I'll, I mean, you, somebody, I'll, what I'll would amend. you suggest in terms of uh, prioritizing? 
I would I would leave that language out, I think, and just have it be. That. I will restate it. Okay. BCPS provide para educators with devices. Um, just that BCPS provide para educators with devices. Um, uh, we'll need the second to agree to the change in the motion, Mr. McMillian. Oh. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstain? The motion carries. Okay, Ms. Scott. I have finally one more. Oh, um, okay. I move that in the proposed budget for FY 2021, that BCPS terminate the Innovative Learning Contract, ARA 210-19, for Culturegram, SIRS Discover, and SIRS Issues Researcher, which has a collective contract spending authority of 300000 because from July 1st, 2019 through July 14th, 2020, all three products had only 440, 464 views, which equates to a per view cost of $107. Is there a second? Second. Just that terminating contract saves $168,317. Board members, discussion? Ms. Joes. Mr. Sears, how do you just terminate a con contract? Are we in the middle of a contract? W what are the terms of this contract? And um, if you could explain more about what this contract entails. Well, most contracts can be uh, terminated for convenience. I don't know the specific details of this contract. For instance, I don't know if we just renewed uh, or if it comes up for renewal, let's say, in April. Um, if we can terminate it, even though we've paid a year's worth of dues, will we get that back, et cetera? So I'll have to, uh, but any contract can be terminated. I just don't know. I can't give you the fiscal impact or the user impact right now. And what does it do academically? Maybe Dr. McComas can answer this. What are the, uh, the Ms. software. Ms. Joes, in the interest of time, this was discussed uh, earlier uh, when Ms. Mack asked questions. So this, this was <coughs> d discussed in, in detail. Oh, no. Okay. Ms. Rowe? Mr. Sears, I believe I've heard you say in the past at building and contracts meetings and other things that if a particular thing isn't funded in the budget, then the contracts have contingencies that if something doesn't have funding, that the contract is no longer void, uh, valid. So if Ms. Mack's motion doesn't provide funding for the contracts, should we have any problem getting out of them? There is a non-appropriation clause uh, in every contract as well. Um, but we are working under the premise that county government is the appropriating authority. But I'm sure if the county adopts uh, the intent and uh, of the motion that that will be uh, theirs to resolve. Yes. Board members, Mr. Kuhn. Just, uh, uh, Ms. Mack, just so that I'm clear, are you talking about terminating the contract immediately or for the fiscal year we're talking about? Okay. So there's no immediate impact now. It's it's for the fiscal year we're discussing. All right, thank you. Other questions or comments, Ms. Scott? Yes, I'm not really clear. What what is it? I'm I'm not really clear. I guess on on what it is. I know it was discussed earlier, but it's been a lot of discussion between now and then. So it's, could there be a brief? It's database uh, lookups. So students look up. Animals so that's what Lisa was asking and, about earlier yes. with the two hundred and seven dollars per view. Yes. Yes. That was the exact thing. Okay. And so what you're saying is is to terminate that for the coming September. Yes. Would there be something that you suggest to go in its place or what would well, like I mean, if we I terminate would, it, what would go there? I would just suggest the fact that we have hundred and fifteen thousand students and it's only been viewed four hundred and sixty four times that students are finding someplace else to find the information. But who that are those need. students viewing it? Are these special needs students? Are these um, no, e-learning students? Hey, Mr. I, uh, excuse me, Dr. Williams would like to 
Oh, thank you, Dr. There were, Williams. There were a lot of questions earlier. I think the team can go back and look at the ramifications. Mm -hmm. You know, even though Ms. Max said September, we just need to look at that contract and see what the actual date is and to give you more specificity around this. But we will add this to the list in terms, if it moves on, we will add this to the list to pro provide more information. Board members, any other questions or comments? All in favor? Please raise your hand. Any opposed? Abstain. The motion carries. Mr. McMillian. I move that. I move that all 24 Baltimore County Public School High School athletic directors currently working 10 months be increased to 12 month employment and continue to receive their extended day assignment stipends for the for each of the three sporting seasons. Second. <laughs> I'm the second. <laughs> now speak on it. Please speak to your motion. Between June 18th and November 30th, 2018, we lost 10 out of the 24 athletic directors for a number of different reasons. That's 42%. This is a hard job to fill. This is a boots on the ground, front line position that deals directly with the community. To me, they're the most, va most visible person representing our schools in the community. They deal with thousands of student athletes and tens of thousands of spectators. They're overworked, undervalued, and underpaid. Thank you. Board members, other questions, comments? Mr. Kuhn. So what, what's the actual impact of moving them to 12 months, giving them? I've seen the figure of $137,000. I don't know how accurate that is. A key part of this is subtracting out the 20 EYE days they currently get over the summer. So they're 10 month employees, they get 20 EYE days. This would shift them to 12 month employees and the 12 month would go if I'm not mistaken, toward their retirement. Mr. Saris, can you confirm that? That number is, is our estimate, yes. <laughs> and the issues, of course, about class load and so forth, union membership will have to be addressed. But financially, we can account for that and put it in the, the budget. Board members, any other questions or comments? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Who's up? Ms. Hen. Thank you. I move to amend the proposed budget by redirecting 10% of funds currently budgeted for digital subscriptions and software license fees, approximately $262,119 to magnet programs. Is there a second? second? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Would you like to speak to your motion? Sure. Um, there's opportunity here not to eliminate usage of these tools, um, for instance, but we have we can leverage our buying power as a large district to renegotiate these contracts. Several of these are coming up for renewal, and the value of 262,119 is um, again that's only 10 percent of the two um, mil over 2.6 million that we spend on these tools. We can renegotiate that and. That 262,000 means a lot more to our magnet programs, um, which are in dire needs. Um, this budget does increase the resources for our magnet programs, which I greatly appreciate. Mm -hmm. However, this is an opportunity that we can do more by renegotiating our contracts with these software vendors. So I see that this is an opportunity to directly help these students. Board members, comments, or questions, Mr. Kuhn? Just a quick question. So the the motion that just prior to uh, um, Mr. McMillian's motion um, that dealt with ending a specific software contract, does that impact the dollar amount that you're proposing? I mean, 10 percent is 10 percent, and that's fine. But is, is it going to have a direct impact on what you're talking about? This dollar amount actually may increase. I believe there are more contracts that may not be included here, so it might be slightly higher. There's some questions I had um, that the team's responding to, but <coughs> this is an approximation. That All right, thank you. Sure. Ms. Scott. Just for clarification, so what you're saying is to review these contracts and renegotiate them, or you're saying to end them and then start new contracts? 
to look at our pricing for these as contracts come up for renewal we have an opportunity to negotiate the pricing and because we are a large district we can negotiate our IT department does a great job in negotiating um, amazing volume mm -hmm. discount pricing so aren't we doing that anyways how I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is how does your at, motion change at the time of contract renewal we are in a unique position to renegotiate pricing with software vendors mm -hmm. So 10% is not an unusual discount to request of software vendors. And even if we were to negotiate that on a small fraction of contracts or a larger negotiation, 25%. So we're not getting 10% right now? We, we may be. What I'm saying is there's an opportunity to leverage any savings from price negotiations or discontinuation. So. I'm not prescribing how to cut that 10 percent if there are tools that we're not using we could realize that 10 percent through other means my motion is not prescriptive what is your uh, maybe i need you to repeat your motion just to distill it down maybe i didn't i move quite get to it. amend the proposed budget by redirecting 10 percent of funds currently budgeted for digital subscriptions and software license fees approximately two hundred sixty two thousand one hundred nineteen dollars to magnet programs Okay, so you want to redirect that money and those contracts and then go after new contracts. No. Okay. I'm, I'm proposing to redirect the funds to our magnet program budget. And then what would happen to the digital programs or where it's going right now? What, what would we do with the, where the money's going right now, the programs that it's going to right now? What would happen? We're paying my motion proposes that we pay less for those or reduce our usage. Pay for less for those and reduce our, our usage. Okay, and then what impact would that have if, if we were to, I understand paying less would save us money, but to reduce the usage, what impact would that have to the uh, programs that are currently benefiting from that usage? Like reduce it by 10%, 50%? This is a question about funds. Mm -hmm. So reducing what we're paying. Okay, I was just following programs. up because you had said usage. All right. So Special just Williams. the point of clarity, um, we are actually, that sounds like a reduction to redirect. So we're taking away from one to add to the magnet program. So I just want to make sure it's clear. It's 10%, but you gave a figure. The ultimate goal is to get to that figure of 262119 Yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. Pasture and then Ms. Joes. Okay, um, just based on the question that Dr. Williams asked, you're trying to get it down to a number, or what, which part is the point? The the amount or where it's going? The motion is to reduce the amount by 10 percent, and the exact figure I would rely on Mr. Tantliff and Mr. Saris to provide. That's an approximation. I'm sorry, I missed that. I was having a microphone moment. Sure. My motion is to redirect 10% of funds currently budgeted for digital subscriptions and software license fees. Mm -hmm. And I would rely on Mr. Saris and Mr. Tantliff to provide that exact number. That the 262,000 is an approximation to provide you for um, fiscal impact purposes. But you don't want to take it out the budget you just want it redirected redirected to magnet programs correct <coughs> all right is, is that in that some, something to help me with this i guess where i'm stuck is if the money is in and we're moving it forward with the money isn't that something in terms of a discussion later or whatever I, i'm just trying to figure out why this change it doesn't change the budget is that right no, it's a net. It's a net neutral impact on the budget. It's changing the bucket. Where? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Ms. Jones. Right, so is it taking it away resources from regular schools to magnet schools to redirecting ten percent of what would have gone to a regular school to a magnet program? No. And don't the magnet programs already have resources right now because? And I don't know, Dr. McComas, if you could answer this. I, I'm still not very clear on what her motion is. 
So my, uh, my understanding is um, first, what we already have proposed in the budget does bring magnet funding up to its highest level as uh, earmarked in 2016. And I believe if, if Mr. Sears, I, I believe I'm saying that correctly, thank you. So what we already proposed brings up the level of magnet funding directly to schools that principals will have at their access. Um, that's separate from what I understand Ms. Hen's proposing. She's proposing that as we renegotiate contracts that are digital resources and they come in at a lower rate or a lower charge because of the fundamental supply and demand, digital resources do come down in pricing, that the difference that with that cost avoidance then can be redirected to support magnet programs is what I understand you're saying. We um, would be redirecting those resources to support uh, instructional programming as, as cost avoidance occurs. So that's a hypothetical situation. That is if the vendor agrees to give you a 10% discount or he may not or give you a 5%. Correct. So it's, it's just a hypothetical then? Correct. All right. Thank you. Yes, we all must be tired. I, I, I think what I keep hearing is that the, re, the motion was to redirect whatever we have in digital subscription and licensing to then go to the magnet program, whether it's up for renewal or not. The goal was 10% and you gave a, a, an amount, but now it's, that was the approximate. So it's right. actually reducing whether it's we're renewing or not, you want us to reduce so that funds will go to MAGNA program. That is correct. Okay, all right. And I had a question. Thank you. I had a question, Dr. McComas. When you um, just stated that the uh, increase in the budget, which we saw and I, and I think is wonderful, to the magnet program levels to 2016, um, is that total? That's not a per pupil? allocation because we have rising number of students in our magnet programs, right? So you're increasing the total, not the per pupil. No, the, the, the total that a school gets is based on the per pupil. So I, as a magnet principal of, of a magnet program, as my enrollment in that program goes up, my per pupil allocation goes up as well. Okay, so the, so the increase that's shown in the operating budget is, um, the rate of per pupil. The rate of per pupil. So if we're restoring it to the 2016 level, we're well, restoring it to the per pupil level at 2016? Yes. Do you know what it was in, say, 2014? I don't have that number right in front of me. Okay. But Did I believe 2016 was the high point. So, for instance, high schools will go from 225 to 250 per pupil. Okay. Thank you. Board members, other questions or comments? Um, so we'll vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Oh, who's abstaining? The motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My I have other motions. Oh, Should okay. I continue? Yep. Okay. I move to amend the proposed budget by increasing the proposed magnet office, office budget by 387000 to restore its funding to FY19 levels. Is there a second? Um, can you speak to your motion? Because based on what Dr. McComas just said, I'm... Yes. So um, the... The current magnet office funds have not been restored. Um, the, in terms of the central office, the FY19 levels um, were 387. I'm trying to locate the page. Um, my motion speaks to that <coughs> reduction and restores the magnet office budget um, by 387,000 to restore funding to the FY19 levels based on the actuals. Questions? So. Mr. Kuhn. Do we know what those funds were for in the central office? 
I'm guessing bodies were they for directors and folks like that. Yeah. Um, they were uh, Brioli funds. with answers. Yeah. They're they're in yeah. bubbles oh. over his head. So, so maybe if he had a microphone, yeah. we could we could. So I, magnet funding, uh, central office funding, just as any of the resources in CNI are actually used to provide materials and resources for schools. And so if we are. Um, uh, I'll use an example uh, Mr. Imbriali and I were discussing the other day. When he was uh, principal at Patapsco High School, I believe um, his music program needed to replace half of the piano, am I saying this right? Uh, piano um, equipment. Um, and so he as a principal communicate with the magnet office and the magnet office covered the replenishment or the replacement of that equipment. So that's how the magnet office resources are ultimately pushed back into schools in the form of materials and resources uh, if there is a space that needs some modification to support the educational program of that magnet. Uh, that's what those resources are used for. Sure. And I, may I speak to that, Madam Chair? Certainly. Okay, so some, some actuals for you, Mr. Kuhn, and other others that are interested. The FY19 actuals were 952874 The FY20 adjusted budget is 50 558,751. Um, those differences occurred in contracted services and supplies and materials. Um, contracted services, the actuals in 19 were 228,224, um, budgeted to 56,000. Supplies and materials, um, actuals were 171,262. Um, budget was 20,800. So my motion increases the FY21 proposed by 387,000, which restores the Magnet Office budget to FY19 levels to be able to support our school magnet programs. Just so, I'm, just so I'm clear, the magnet programs being increased by 680 some thousand dollars we just passed a motion to add another $262,000. And now we want to add 300 and how much? So my prior motion was for 262,000. No, no, what's to, this motion? Directly for? to schools. To schools. Yes. This is for the central office magnet office. All right. Thank you. For 387,000. Thank you. Can I ask you Ms. Hen and maybe staff can support this. We are trying to increase access and opportunity in an equitable fashion across the county so that more students have access, especially related to CTE, where we know that uh, more students in terms of workforce development, that there are jobs that are available, that there are options to um, everyone going to college right away. So is, is the intent with uh, putting these resources back in the central office is there would that be the intent to increase the the access and opportunity across the county yes it is one of the department objectives as stated in the budget book and it's page 263 is to ensure equity of access to magnet programs for all students and to ensure countywide implementation of BCPS policies rules and admission procedures for magnet programs so again, to ensure equitable access countywide for all students. And that is um, something that we've heard is, is a need. Um, and as we expand our magnet programs, that need um, will be greater, and we will need the resources within the central office to be able to support the magnet expansions that this budget does provide for. Ms. Rowe. So I just wanted to clarify something that um, I only recently learned is that those magnet office budgets, it's my understanding, sometimes will supplement when magnet programs have some kind of an emergency or they fall short of funding for some unpredictable reason. And so I don't think that, and I can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that saying in this particular case, that that money in the central office, it doesn't really stay in the central office. It gets redirected to the schools in addition to whatever the school-based funding is based on some particular need. 
So like, for instance, if you don't have lighting the day before a concert and you decide to get the lighting repaired and the money has to be found in the budget, the, ma the magnet office might have that money so that your school arts program doesn't then become obliterated for the rest of the year is one example. Are there other questions or comments? Just no, to sure, Ms. Pasture, you've already spoken. Ms. Pasture. Oh. I would just like um, Dr. McComas to speak to, uh, or Mr. Embriali to speak to um, Ms. Rose's comment. I just, I, I, I just need to know that this money goes beyond as much as I love the arts, the arts, and that it really gets filtered to CTE and all of those other places for which I have a passion. So, so yes, and I will also say that uh, keep in mind that CTE, while it commingles with Magnet, CTE mm -hmm. is also a, a stand it's aside right. uh, programming as well. Uh, and I just would like to say, um, before I hand it to Mr. Inverally, if he has any further details, uh, keep in mind that um, while absolutely our long-term goal is to provide full equitable access in the different regions around our magnet programs, we proceed um, cautiously with expanding magnet because it also has transportation implications. And as we all know, we are sensitive to the demands already on my friend and air transportation office, who I love dearly. And I would add to that oftentimes unique staffing implications. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to mention that the per pupil allocation for magnet programs for elementary, middle, and high school comes out of the central amount that's given to the magnet office. So the magnet office receives the money through a central fund and then distributes that money to each of the magnet schools based on the per pupil allocation. And then the remaining amount of money is, as Ms. Rowe mentioned, used to provide supports when those magnet schools and those programs need it because those programs are defined as unique and distinct in terms of the programs they're offering. So we need to make sure that we're providing the resources necessary if there is a problem that occurs or a challenge that occurs for a particular building. Lighting was a, was a, was a great example. I'm only working on two digits now, so <laughs> since I, and I wanted you to say that because very often we just lump CTE into magnet. Um, so we, I need everybody to just extract that from their thinking. So the 300 and some thousand dollars, where is that going now? I probably should know that, but I, I might have known it this morning, but I don't know it again. Where is it going that was taken out that the motion wants to put back? What are we, what, what's going on? What's happening with it? I can't even talk. Repeat it. Isn't it to put money back yes. in? Mm -hmm. So if it's being put back in, it was taken out to go somewhere, mm -hmm. right? Or right. is it because it's, really it's almost 12 o'clock? It's just an ad. I just need to know. Where is it? It's just an ad. What? At this point, it's just an ad, right? Okay. It's just an increase in the budget, but no, because we, we've added things and there were things that were added as well. So that 300 and some went somewhere, even if you can't put your finger right on it, but it's money that's in a pot that we use. It's not ethereal, it's real. All right, so I'll just withdraw that. Board member, any other discussion? That's all, all in favor of uh, Ms. Hen's motion, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Ms. Scott? I'd like to make a motion. Oh. Yes, thank you. Do you want me to thank come you. back for the rest of my okay. um, so this is a little different. I move that in the proposed budget fiscal year 21, that in the interest of allowing and encouraging more parents to attend board meetings, that 
I move that the Board of Education, Baltimore County, provide child care to parents attending board meetings during the first regularly scheduled board meeting of each month, starting in July on a first come, first serve basis for children ages two years and older. Is there a second? Second. Yes, I would. Um, there's precedence for this. There other boards that offer um, child care, drop-in services. Uh, the staff has been wonderful to send me information on how something like that could happen and the feasibility of it and the parameters around it. We offer it when we have community meetings. We offer it when the superintendent goes out and meets various places. And um, I'm thinking it would be something that maybe we could look at for maybe a year or 12-month period to see if that is something that our parents could make use of and would feel comfortable um, in doing so and encourage um, more attendance at, at board meetings and allowing parents to come and speak and participate. Thank you. Uh, questions, Ms. Rowe and then Mr. Offerman? So are you suggesting this as a pilot and do you know what the fiscal impact That's of that is? I don't believe it's been done here before. Um, I checked with the um, staff, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, if there has been child care that was offered previously. If not, then it would be a, a pilot. And the fiscal impact, as I see it, um, this was sent to us in our, um, in our weekly updates. If we were to do um, every board meeting, um, I had said 12, so doing one meeting a month, it would be roughly around, looks like 25,000. Um, and there was... A, Sorry? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I thought you were talking to me. Um, yeah, so, uh, and basically starting during the um, open session and, um, but yeah, that's roughly the estimates that they gave and um, for right now, as opposed to what the fiscal impact would be. Ms. Joes? So that is $25,000 a year, is that correct? Yes, for a 12 month and period. And so it would be one board meeting and it would start around six just before public session and then end around seven. That's what I was thinking, yes. Okay. About an right. hour. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions or comments? All in favor? Oh, Ms. Pester. Do we need a contract for that? Yes, it looks like there it would be. Um, uh, there would be a contract. It says, um, looks like the they would review contracts and also um, review existing space and where it would be available. So it says um, that we would have options of negotiating for specialized contracted services. This is from whom? Which staff? Who? Oh, from. As, okay. I was just wondering who the they. Okay, and, you, and one part you wrote, raised your hand. Yeah, we they. we made some <laughs> estimates and. Uh, the way the motion structured will significantly lower the cost from the estimate, and uh, the hard part will just be finding a provider, um, you know, that's convenient. And but limiting it to an hour will significantly help. So, considering it's a pilot program, it hasn't been done before, and it would be the first time. Mr. Kuhn. Okay. Um, so just so we're clear, is is the the child care going to be in, in total of like three hours for the night? Because you'd have to get there, drop the child off, come over. And I don't honestly know where the plan is to do it. So I don't know if it's actually in this building on site. Uh, this building is probably not, uh, does not comply with the facilities that the state will require in terms of lavatories and so forth. Closest one I could come up with was West Towson, assuming that the pre-K facility might be available. Uh, there are a couple of other, we could only identify a few drop-in providers in the county that are not really close to us. So we're going, we would approach as many as we could find and see what their capacity is. And just to, 
to finish out. What is the age range you're talking about? Um, I said we could do it as uh, young as two, ages two and up. Do, do we want to limit, limit that? I said, would we want to limit it because kids of certain ages have come to our meetings and sat quietly and or said the pledge or whatever? I'm <coughs> curious, what, do we want to like really narrow it so that? Well, we couldn't take babies, so it would have to be it. Two, two and up, and like up, up to But up you're to saying what? limiting it as like far not as. Not up to 18, like up Not to, to like 18. Um, there wasn't a cap that was put on. <laughs> I'm just curious because. I would say probably 10. But um, again, that's where I would defer to the school system, you know, the experts in that, as far as what the age range would be and um, how, that, how that would play out. But yeah, I'm assuming we wouldn't take 18, 16, 17-year-old high school students. No, Ralph, that would keep Ralph busy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. <laughs> that motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Ms. Rowe? So I have a motion. I move that BCPS add $15 million to this budget to provide the school system with funding flexibility to negotiate with bargaining units for adding 15 minutes to the school day. Second. So um, the purpose for this motion is because we heard that if it's not in the budget, it can't be negotiated. So in the interest of furthering potential negotiations for that 15 minutes, apparently we need to add it in the budget. Questions and comments? Uh, I'm just asking that, uh, that I, I, under, I heard your motion clearly. This is not tied to planning time specifically, correct? No, it's just putting $15 million in the budget to allow the school system to have that $15 million as a tool to negotiate with the bargaining units to see whatever they can come up with up to that amount to add 15 minutes to the school day or, you know, five or 10 or whatever we can get out of that. Because the state has wanted us to add that 15 minutes and our school day is shorter. Um, whether that involves planning time or anything else, I'll leave that to the negotiating teams. Mr. Offerman. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, is, when the state is asked us to add the 15 minutes, the state, uh, my understanding is, is that has to do with the high school time. Is that is that correct? That's primarily where we run into constraints with the state requirements, yeah. Okay. So, uh, and, and I'm, uh, maybe it's the wrong time to bring this up, uh, you know, is it potentially, is it possible to add 15 minutes to the high school day and not to the elementary or the middle day? Uh, it's just in terms of cost saving. It's tough because we have to treat all TABCO members equally and we have to coordinate, we have the transportation schedules and so forth. Mr. Kuhn and then Mr. McMillian. Uh, so Mr. Saris, if we were talking about 15 minutes, adding 15 minutes across the entire enterprise, um, how much money would that be? So our calculation was $26.8 million uh, based on, I think it was current staffing levels and not uh, the any additional positions that we've proposed in the budget is that correct? Yeah. Next year's compensation. All right. All right. Thanks. Mr. McMillian. So if it's twenty-six point eight million dollars at current staffing, how does the fifteen million dollars play into this? My thought was that right now we have nothing in the budget to negotiate for any additional time, and therefore it can't be negotiated because any budget that passes won't have any money passed for negotiation. And I would think that a, a creative group of people could take $15 million and negotiate something, whether it's 
in ex- there, there's other things bargaining units want besides money. And if we put some money in the pot for there to be some negotiation, maybe bargaining units would want to find a way to get that $15 million as opposed to not adding any additional time to the day in the school system giving that $15 million to the county. So if there's, you know, a carrot to chase after, maybe it will strengthen the position of adding those 15 minutes. And we know the county didn't want to give us the 27 million last time, so maybe they'll go for a lower amount. Ms. Hen. Ms. Rowe, would you please restate your motion? I'm interested in the 15-minute okay. clause. I move that BCPS add $15 million to this budget to provide the school system with funding flexibility to negotiate with bargaining units for adding 15 minutes to the school day. <coughs> Ms. Hen. Would you accept um, an amendment to modify the 15 minutes to read an extended school day so that it's not specific or yes, yes, I'll, yes I'll accept that thank you um, I seconded that do you accept that I'm not sure that I do uh, what we the, the 15 minutes comes very specifically from the fact that that would get Baltimore County Public Schools to the state average so we have the shortest day by 15 minutes and so what we're trying to achieve is to allow our teachers to have the same time as teachers in other districts our students to have the same time that they have in other districts throughout the state of Maryland in order to achieve a program of academic excellence um, and so, so what you're suggesting is that we either get the whole 15 minutes in one year or we take nothing I think any step in a direction of added time is better than nothing so if we leave it open-ended, maybe we can negotiate for the whole 15, or maybe we can negotiate for five, or the negotiating parties end up at a stalemate and nobody gets anything. I don't know, I'm just trying to put something in there to negotiate with. I would support between 10 and 15. I mean, I think if we're gonna ask <coughs> the school system to make this change, it needs to be worthwhile because there are logistical issues, tremendous logistical issues. So adding between 10 and 15 minutes to the school day, I think that's fair because I think five minutes isn't worth $15 million. That's correct. Between 10 and 15, okay. So I'm changing the motion to BCPS add $15 million to this budget to provide the school system with funding flexibility to negotiate with bargaining units for adding between 10 and 15 minutes to the school day. I'll support the second. Mr. McMillian. The piece I don't understand, if they project $26.8 million for 15 minutes, and I understand that you want something in the pot, mm -hmm. you know, the $15 million, but if, if those people are representing me and I'm paying their union dues, I'm not, I'm not going to like the fact that, that they're compromising half of that. Well, I can't see that, uh, I can't see that working. So we've heard different many, many, many I mean, I can't go into the details in open session, but we've heard many, many different types of things offered. Some of it involves, the estimate that was at 26 million involved just money compensation in last year's budget. But there are other things bargaining units want. Planning time, as we've heard them talk about. Um, we need to be mindful of. Okay. Well, I mean, this is what they say when they sit here, so. But there are other things they want, and they may be willing to negotiate for some of that, or not, and then in which case, then not. So you're not, you're just not focusing on the 10 to 12 minutes, you're, or 10 to 15 minutes, you're looking at other things. I'm suggesting that without money in the factor, that, there, that, that there's not a lot to work with. So by putting money in the budget, it gives the, the negotiating um, parties something to work with that they don't currently have in the budget. And I think that without any money, we're not going to get any movement on 15 minutes. And if it's not in the budget, then it can't be negotiated. And right now, there's no money for that 15 minutes or added time of the day.
So this is a proposed budget that the county would have to approve. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm associate myself with Mr. McMillian around the $15 million. That's causing some anxiety on this end because the 15 minutes we would have to plan and we would have to plan like now to start for September, whatever that date is. So I don't know if it's best to say, just add 15 minutes without the $15 million. I'm not quite understanding well, because of the proposed process and the planning that's going to happen. Not n there's the negotiation piece, and, and just I just want to bring to your attention, uh, Ms. Mack, and we supported about the 2% colas and the bonuses. So Are you suggesting I, need, I need clarity on, on this last one. Oh. And I think what I'm seeking is if it's, is if it's about the 15 minutes, if we get that agreement, as a system, we have to revamp so many things um, associated with adding additional minutes to a schedule. Well, I think I'm unwilling to suggest that we should add 15 minutes without compensating teachers and staff anything. So what I'm hearing Dr. Williams say is that there's two issues. One is if the board decides that we want to add 15 minutes to the day, then we, we say that and approve that and then the school system and the bargaining units will have to work it out. If we tie it directly to getting funding, then we won't know until the end of May whether the funding comes. And so then Dr. Williams will have the choice of planning something that may not happen or being caught at the end of May having to plan for something that is going to happen system-wide. Is that a fair analysis? Yes, but I'm, you know, again, like Dr. McConus, we've been up since 4.30 in the morning, so maybe I'm just not comprehending the motion. From my understanding of this issue. <laughs> well, it, it is something that could be divided. I guess I just don't could know. Could be separated. I because was, we could do that? I mean, could we say that we want 15 minutes added to the day, period, start doing it? with no money in any budget to do it? I thought the budget process came first. <laughs> let's, let's think about that for a minute. Ms. Pesture. Because you can't, we can't just add, schools can't just tomorrow or next month or whatever, just add 15 minutes. So it takes, planning it takes time it takes a lot of things so i guess the question is is the you know the board has talked about 15 minutes and we've heard uh tabco talk about planning time and um all of the needs of our staff no. so how does it happen that how do we make progress in this area if we are always in the in the stage of waiting for the approval of the money, in, but then that's always at the end, unless we come up with a statement that we are going to add 15 minutes to the next cycle and that somehow those finances need to be baked in from the very beginning of the operating budget. Then that would give the op opportunity for the school system to plan and it would also give an opportunity for additional negotiations in the next cycle. But I'm just throwing that out there as discussion. I'm not modifying the motion. But the or next cycle won't be a bargaining unit year. And if previous years we were told we couldn't do the 15 minutes because it wasn't a bargaining year. This is the year the school system told us we could do this. That's a good point. Mr. Kuhn. So since negotiations are ongoing, do we table this idea and ask the superintendent to focus on more time? Well, didn't we just hear that 
if it's not in the budget proposal, we can't negotiate it. And there's no money in the budget proposal for 15 minute school day right now. So it seems like we're being caught up in a, kitchen, a chicken or the egg thing where the, the board, I think I want to, I've heard other members say they want to pursue this state request that's been ongoing for multiple years to add 15 minutes to the school day. Since I've been on the board, I've been looking for ways to do this, and every time we come up with a way to do it, first we're told it's not a bargaining unit year and it has to be negotiated, then we're told this or that, then we're told, so, and now we're being told, oh, it doesn't matter if it's not a bargaining unit year, let's just, I, you know, someone tell me what the board needs to do to get this 15 minutes both funded and bargaining unit negotiated and done. Um, Mr. Kuhn? So I would suggest we just added $17 million with a 2% increase. So perhaps there can be some negotiation around that. That's all I'll say. I'm sorry, Mr. Kuhn, could you repeat what you said? So in a previous motion, we, we increased the budget by $17 million to give everyone a 2% COLA adjustment. That's, that's what I'm saying. So there's a lot of money there. Okay, point taken. Mr. <coughs> Burke. Yeah, Mrs. Causey, in my Would you mind sure. using a microphone, please? Thank you, Mr. Burke. In my understanding, whether or not it's budgeted in, in, the, in this proposal or whether the compensation occurs in some other way besides mon a monetary uh, award, it has to be negotiated with the bargaining unit. Um, and, and so my concern is you might make a decision to make that increase without having it approved by the bargaining unit, and then I don't know what that means. Uh, um, I, I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, so what would it take for our, for our negotiating team and our bargaining unit to come up with a solution in 10 days, and then we can table this motion until the, our February 25th meeting? Mr. Saris. Uh, the 10 day uh, time period um, creates a, a, uh, an issue because we won't know in, in that period of time if county government is really going to fund any or all of this proposal. So we're kind of negotiating on a contingency basis that if it's uh, funded um, that, that we can try to reach an agreement. So it'll, it, it won't be, it will be difficult for Dr. Williams to then start planning uh, just based on a contingent, you know, or tentative agreement. In a way, our whole operating budget is contingent. True, we know we're getting maintenance of effort. <laughs> right, so. That's true. Right. Um, I think, well, in the interest of time, if we don't have a conclusion to this, I would like the board to maybe think about a process that the board would approve to try and make progress on this before the next meeting? We so do have to dispose of the motion. Yes, can we table the motion? Can we postpone it till the end of the meeting to see if anyone else has anything else to address? Can we postpone it till other motions are considered? I'll second the postponement. Okay, thank you. Um, board members, are there other questions or comments or motions? Ms. Hen, and I have one motion. 
So I have a question that may lead to a motion, if I may, Mr. Saris and Mr. Tantlin. I'll give it a try. Okay. Um, so it has to do with the, the office of ESOL. Um, <laughs> Dr. McComas. <laughs> okay. So there was an increase, I know, to um, for the salary of one new position for 101000 I believe, for the bilingual communications coordinator in the office of ESOL. There was also an increase of approximately 350000 and I wasn't sure what that increase was to be used for, for FY21. So that was my question, and then I have a motion depending on, I may have a motion depending on the answer to that. I'm working on getting the page. I've been flipping back and forth. Possibly 227. Yes. Possibly. No. That's not. Give me one second. Thank you. Page 249. Um, salaries and wages increased from um, 478,209 to 954,365. And I know that 101,000 of that increase is for the bilingual communication officer. And I'm wondering what the difference is for in that office. If that's a school, for, that wouldn't be for school-based positions, would it? For ESOL teachers? Does anyone know? So the bilingual communication officer, even though it says ESOL office, is going into the community engagement and, commun and communications. I think we talked about that in the budget <laughs> preparation. It says from the ESOL office, but we were adding a bilingual communication officer. <coughs> okay, so even if, though it's in the budget book under the ESOL office budget? Correct. It's going into the communication office? It's going office? into the communication office. Okay, so that leads but me I don't to know ask that. then what the 400, I can't do the math in my head. Ms. Hen, uh, late, one chunk but, of it, I'll have to find out the exact amount, but um, a chunk of money is moved from contracted services to contract employees. So it just moved from one line to the other. That's why the salaries, that's one of the items pushing the salaries up on that page. You can see contracted okay. services are so, dropping by 300,000. Right. So it moved into salaries. The, the 285,000 difference moved into salaries and wages. Yes, from that contracted plus the new employees. position and call as account for everything. <laughs> so, so that still leaves quite a significant number, minus 285, minus 478, bear with me one second. So 191,365. So I guess it's just 90,000 90, increase in salaries and wages. So that's probably colas and steps. Then Mr. Tantla, um, most likely. That colas and steps in that budget are probably about 50,000. Okay. Okay, then I don't need to, to make that motion then. Thank you. Then my next motion um, is I move to amend the budget for fiscal year 2021 by redirecting 120,000 from network support services, contracted services, to internal audit for the creation of one professional FTE for the creation of an IT auditor position reporting to the board. Is there a second? Second. 
second that. Um, uh, please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, with the, the volume and the complexity of projects that our, our IT shop um, handles, and they're, they're doing a fantastic job, there's considerable risk. And with the increasing complexity of security concerns, um, this board um, has responsibility and, and needs greater resources to ensure that security controls are present, um, reporting to the board um, with this, this responsibility. And this is a need that we currently don't have the resources within our internal audit group to provide. Um, this represents a small fraction of the current contracted services budgeted amount within network support services. Um, the budget reflects an increase overall in this department of nine million in network projects. And with that amount of um, projects coming through this group, it does require a higher level of oversight. So this position would be responsible for providing that oversight, reporting directly to the board on the status of that project, as well as um, on the security controls um, as an independent oversight um, position um, residing within the internal audit group and reporting to the audit committee. Ms. Scott? Yes, you said this would be an independent oversight position reporting to the audit committee. Would that position not report back to the full board? Yes, the board's audit committee and then through the, to the full board. So they would report to the audit committee first and then the audit committee would report to the board or? Well, the audit committee meets with the internal audit group. That's So this position would be a full-time staff Correct. person. Mm -hmm. And they would report to the audit committee, which is comprised of members of the board. Yes. Okay. As opposed to reporting to the board. Well, and um, that's how no, it reports that's to how the board. It, so I'm on the audit committee. So we have the audit committee meetings. <coughs> staff mm -hmm. shares with us what, what they're doing. And then when it's finalized, whatever the reports are, then those are shared with the full board. Isn't the Office of Audits already doing this, though? Are you saying that they need an additional staff person? Are, are they overwhelmed? Or it, it sounds like this could be, there could be some redundancy. This position would have, ex this person in this position would have expertise that we currently don't have within the internal audit group, specifically IT expertise, too. So this would be an IT person or? An IT, IT person auditor. or like a, mm -hmm. so this would be an IT auditor. And the expertise in there right now is, more so accounting or? Correct. Okay, so this would be a different type of auditor, an IT auditor as opposed to an accounting auditor. Yes. So then who would supervise, would they, they would be supervised directly by the board? They would resign within the internal audit group. By so then who would auditor. supervise their work if it's accountants supervising an IT professional? Our chief, internal, chief of internal audit. Which has a background in accounting. Auditing. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn, uh, and then Mr. McMillian. So I believe there is a need that this position is targeted towards. I'm not convinced that, um, that as an organization that we are better off by trying to hire a specialized resource like this and bring them internal, I would think it might make sense to put aside contracting dollars and bring an outside entity out to review in depth all of what's going on within our IT group here. That's just my comment. Um, can staff, I thought I read something in the list of the answers to questions in terms of, thank you, Mr. Corns, in terms of uh, um, initiatives that you're working on. We, Is there something in there that already addresses this? We have proposed to do an in-depth audit um, with, um, we had been asked about penetration testing, but we need to go deeper than that. And I'm gonna, I don't wanna speak to the direct number until I can find them as causey, but I believe it's a neighborhood of $300,000 that we proposed that has made it into the superintendent's proposed budget to perform an in-depth audit of our IT practices and our security protocols and our, firewall uh, uh, configurations and uh, our staff training on response to um, phishing. So we, we have this in the plan in our proposed budget. 
Okay, and that would be using a con a, con a, con a contract. Uh, yes. So an we, outside provider. Yeah. So we would we would uh, seek an RFP that would spell out what what exactly we're seeking and bring in an agency, ex from an external source to do an independent evaluation of our practice. Okay. Would it make sense, Ms. Hen, to may I speak correlate? Well, certainly. Sure. So um, to speak to that, thank you, Mr. Corns, and thank you, Mr. Kuhn, for your comments. Three hundred and seventy-nine thousand dollars that we proposed. Okay. on page 206. Okay. So uh, the one-time audit, and I agree that's very necessary and very valuable. I don't see the two as mutually exclusive. I think the one-time audit is is absolutely um, necessary and valuable and so certainly, Mrs. Hen, as if as I may this finish, was, Mr. Corns, uh, sure. the, the one-time audit is certainly necessary and I would support funding that. Um, and in fact, that was one motion that I considered making in terms of providing the, the funding for that in, in this budget had it not been already included. Mm -hmm. um, but it is best practice, and this is by no means um, a sign of a lack of trust by any means. It's a best practice for boards to look for this specialized type of resource in terms of governance, um, especially in um, these days with cybersecurity concerns um, becoming ever more prevalent and the risks growing, this is the type of resource that boards are seeking as an independent resource. So it's in no means, I don't want to be misconstrued that the intent of making this motion is more of a governance factor than any um, anything else. So just to make so, my intentions clear. So just so we're, we're, so we're clear with the budget request we've made, we've asked for $379,000 annually to include this is this is an annual cost increase in the IT budget to perform this annual evaluation. So if, if that is not an, the appropriate uh, use of those funds, then we certainly re-examine. And again, I'll reiterate that I don't see the two as mutually exclusive. The focus of this position, again, in my vision, is not strictly technical in terms of um, you mentioned penetrate, penetration testing and more on the technical side. Um, this position would also be responsible for fiscal oversight and looking at controls of that sort as well um, because that is um, the board's responsibility. So in alignment with our questions and, and oversight responsibilities, this would be a resource to us as we look at IT spending. and. Being on the building and contracts committee, a lot of the, the contracts we we see and percentage of spend have to do with our IT spend. That's a, a large portion of the, the system spend. So this is a resource I think will be invaluable to to the board, not not from a sheer technical technical audit perspective, but simply as a resource to the board. Ms. Mack and then Mr. McMillian. Since it sounds like there is some type of synergy between what you are describing and what Ms. Hen is describing, I thought initially the 379 was a one time. But if we can, re if we can accomplish the same thing, I think you proposed one, 120? Per year. Per 120 salary. per year, and you're saying 379. Um, in the, being the physically responsible person I am, I'd have to say that it makes more sense to hire somebody at 120 and just have that person pick up the part that you just described there, Mr. Korn. Would you like to respond to that? I'm deferring to Okay, board. Mr. Kuhn. <laughs> just to follow, um, is this 379, when, when you talk about IT assessment and security services, um, are you talking about an ongoing security review of everything within the boundary of BCPS? Is that what this is designed for? So, Mr. Kuhn, our, our plan is has always been to do an annual audit, but given many of the things that we've heard about in other LEAs and Baltimore City specifically, we've asked for a much more in-depth that has actually increased the cost of what we would normally have paid. So yes, this is, this is our annual review of our practices, our security, our configurations. Um, are we putting the right things in the right place? Our processes, our disaster recovery, our continuance of operation plan, all those are under this evaluation. All right, thank you. Sure. 
Mr. McMillian. Ms. Hen, the position you described, is that within the organizational structure of the internal office, internal audit office? Internal audit, yes. So it's not going to be an independent position that sort of floats out there by itself? Correct. And who would interview and hire for this position? The chief of internal audit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Mr. Kuhn. All right, well, it's not, it's not for the specific motion, so I'll, I'll pass. Never mind. Okay. Can you restate your motion, then we're going to vote? Sure. I move to amend the proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 by redirecting 120000 from network support services, contracted services, to internal audit for the creation of one professional FTE for an IT auditor reporting to the board. All in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstained? The motion fails for lack of a... Uh, motion fails. Um, okay. Shall I continue? Sure. Okay. Um, I move to amend the proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 by increasing technology support services, supplies, and materials by 630000 for the purchase and installation of 14 digital school signs, two per council manic district. Is there a second? Mr. Kuhn, uh, please speak to your motion. Sure. Um, the digital school signs are an effective communication tool for engaging with our families, um, particularly in schools that have a hard time reaching families that are on a are otherwise not engaged with our schools. I hear from school, I go in schools and hear from them that the signs are a way to reach families who are otherwise not engaged with them. They're on heavily trafficked streets. They, for some, they, they're eye catching. They convey information. They attract visitors to the school. They attract community engagement. Um, it's, it's a communications tool that is very effective. Um, administrators ask PTAs for their support in fundraising to purchase signs. Um, also as an issue of equity, um, imagine yourself as a student and to go into your school with a non-digital sign or a um, broken sign and passing on your way to school a fancy new digital sign. It, it certainly is an, an equitable facility issue. And we do have schools that, that are in need of these signs. So while the cost may be prohibitive to replace or install these all in one year, um, the intent is to be able to install these on a gradual basis, which is what my motion intends to do. And by um, distributing that resource equitably across the county um, by dividing these by council manic district. I have a question um, for staff. If we have a bilingual communications officer, could we then have these signs provide the school information in multiple languages? So while I'm not personally familiar with how you program a digital marquee, I don't think that there'd be anything that would prohibit us from doing that. Because I do, we do hear that, that we have communities that, that don't go on the website, that um, you know, don't feel as connected, and certainly that is a way to extend um, and include more, more members of community. Ms. Pasteur, did you have a point? Julie, restate it, or? Sure. Excuse me. I'm Dr. Williams was raising his hand. Yeah, so I, <clears throat> I'm wondering if it's not the technology, but just looking at ways that we can connect our families and communities. Um, I don't think, so I heard the motion, and I understand what you said, Ms. Hen, but the piece was around that families are saying they're not connected or not having information. I don't know if that's the best way of connecting families and communities versus some things that we do differently or built on around family and community partnerships. Um, so I just had to just share that a little bit. I don't think the sign will get us to 
more parent engagement or knowing what's going on. Ms. Scott, Thank and you. then Ms. Rowe. How would we decide, um, or would it be up to the board member to decide which schools, I guess, which two schools per district the signs went to? Sure, so our, um, our staff know, have a list, have an inventory, and know which schools um, would be in need of those signs, so I would trust staff to make that call. So staff would, like if there's like five schools that need it, then staff would determine which of those five? Sure. Okay. And Ms. Pester had asked me to restate my motion, so I will go ahead and do that. I move to amend the proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 by increasing technology support services, supplies, and materials by 630,000 for the purchase and installation of 14 digital school signs, two per council Manic district. And I will add that this motion does have um, county council support from two districts, one in the Northwest and one in the Northeast, as well as um, possible county executive support. Ms. Rowe. So I just wanna say that respectfully to the superintendent, I completely disagree that not having a digital sign is impactful for parent support because there have been schools who have been able to use their digital sign because it rotates different messages to help inform parents about everything in the community from Amber Alerts to um, rec council programs that are currently enrolling to the Easter egg hunt that happens in the community every year to all sorts of things. And I, there has been the one off occasion where I might have missed an event at my own kid's school if it hadn't been for the sign. So, you know, there's a lot of noise out there in the world and having a sign right in front of the school that people drive by, walk their dog by and everything else and those messages are easier to change than those stupid flip numbers in the middle of winter will make information more current for the community. That's informational, though. What he was talking about is real community and school engagement with parents. Like, that's, that's giving information, but to really engage with parents, a sign is excellent to give out information, to let about upcoming, um, parents know about upcoming events, but to really engage and connect with parents, it's, it's, it's the sign is maybe a first step, but it's also a lot more after that. And I think that's all the superintendent was intending. Okay, thank you. And uh, Ms. Pasture. Okay, are you um, asking that we just do 14 period or is this ongoing? I, did you say that? I mean, sure. like next year so we'll ask for 14 more the so intent, that every school ends up with one. The intent is for every school to have one. Since we're, mod since we're amending this annual budget, the scope of the motion is limited to this budget, mm -hmm. but that would be my intent for every school to for every have one. Yeah. Okay, any final thoughts before I call the vote? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries unanimously. Are you finished? I am not. You are not. Okay. Okay. Let me know when you're ready to share the stage. <laughs> okay. My next motion, I move to amend the proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 by increasing the Department of Facilities Management budget by 1.4 million to repair, maintain, and resurface if necessary, seven high school running tracks, one per council Manic district. Second. Can we let Rod second it? Because he's, he's all things sports, right? Okay. We will not only let Rod second it, would Mr. McMillian, would you like to speak to the motion? It took us 30 some years to get the track repaired at Chesapeake High School. Kenwood's track is in terrible shape. I don't think that they can actually run track events in the spring because of the track. Uh, the modern technology, I've observed that they spray through a gunite machine shredded rubber onto the, uh, an asphalt base. And the, the new tracks are superior to what the old asphalt center kind of track was. So that, and as a former athletic director and physical education teacher, 
there's a real need to resurface tracks around this county. Any other questions or comments, Ms. Shore? <coughs> okay, you just say all tracks, all schools. What did you say? Seven. Seven. Seven high okay. I said. You said um, in all areas, one districts, in one in each district. Okay, I yes. get it. Thanks, Rob. Seven, one per district. Okay, and if a district needs to, needs more than one, how do we make that determination? <coughs> We include that in next year's budget. But how do we determine for this fiscal year which one? What do you do? Throw the, put the names in that box. Well, staff would have to. Staff with would advise. We will let staff do we'll it. Let staff They'll know advise. which ones are the oldest and which ones are the. Right. And it, <laughs> right, schools can decide. You get a track or you get a sign. What do you want? Okay. All in favor? Please raise your hand. It's unanimous. Um, thank you. Um, board members, I have a motion, and I did have copies, but they fell on the floor, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> I move to amend the proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 by increasing the Board of Education salaries and wages budget by 149,000 for the restoration of a 1.0 professional FTE position for an OMS, ombudsman to respond to uh, BCPS stakeholders. Second. Thank you, I I'm, I'm have another phrase. Um, I move to amend the proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 by redirecting the vacant chief communications officer position funds to a board of education 1.0 professional FTE for a chief of staff supporting the board. Um, no, so you combine them second. Um, and actually, this the financial impact is potentially neutral, where I had included a budget of 149000 for the restoration of the 1.0 professional FTE position for an ombudsman. Um, uh, in the past, the chief communications officer um, position, I believe, was around $200,000. So if the chief of staff position is around 100,000 and we can get an ombudsman for around 100,000, it would, would actually be budget neutral. Um, but I wanted to put those that dollar value in there to have as a uh, placeholder. And there's been a second. And um, so I'll speak to my motion. The Board of Education, um, well, in my history with the Board of Education, we've had student discipline hearings and things of the, that nature, where um, in the past, the ombudsman had been able to work out a lot of situations where we didn't have a lot of those appeals and different things going on. So the, the first goal is to, number one, uh, provide our students with the best academic experience and, and to provide the parents uh, a easier way to facilitate that when sometimes things get um, a bit contentious. So that has happened in the past, and I think board members can understand the amount of emails that we get with concerns and um, to be able to have a way to coordinate more effectively as the board with the superintendent and his staff to kind of have that direct uh, person to person so that it's not 12 people sending a million emails a million different places. Uh, the other issue related to chief of staff, um, when um, Julie and I became the chair and the vice chair last year, we had a planning session and we had a number of initiatives that we thought would be very helpful in terms of governance and community engagement. And I'll just quickly read uh, the policies, not the, all the policies, but policy 1100, community relations, um, the board of, Education believes engaging parents, community members, and business in the educational process plays a key role in student success. Policy 1200, community relations. The Board of Education is committed to fostering and supporting community interest and involvement in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, policy 1230, community relations, community involvement, area education advisory councils. We have our next dinner coming up um, next week. It's only two per year. There's a lot of engagement that our area education advisory councils, they want to um, support 
and they want to advise and they want to uh, gather community input. And there's really been a bottleneck um, of opportunity because board members are volunteers. We get 7,500, but we are very engaged and we have one executive assistant who is amazing. Can I, uh, can I get a round of applause? But she is one for 12 with a community of 15, 115,000 students and all those parents and other people. So, um, and also policy 1210, I can't forget because she's still here from PTA Council, President Ms. Jane Lee, um, that community involvement relationship with parent and teacher association. So um, that is speaking to my motion. Ms. Rowe. So I don't know, maybe a lot of people aren't aware of this, but it's an odd thing that we no longer have an ombudsman because Baltimore County was the first school system in the state to have an ombudsman such that every other school system in the state decided to follow our example and have their own ombudsman. And now the Office of Education Accountability is looking at us like, Why'd you get rid of your ombudsman? What happened here? Because the ombudsman creates a lot of accountability in the school system. And so I think it's very weird <laughs> that somehow recently our ombudsman just disappeared. Well, I, I'll just say in general, there was a lot of budget realignment for the STAT program. So when we were paying for laptops, it, it took a lot of money out of a lot of places. And I think that as we're realigning technology with, uh, with the more fiscally sustainable Chromebooks, um, that now we need to realign, as Dr. Williams says, the schoolhouse and these things that are really gonna allow our children to, um, to improve. Part of that is engagement, part of that is dealing with uh, issues that arise, um, and part of that is the board being a better governing board. Mr. Saris, and then Ms. Uh, Pasteur, and then Ms. Scott. Just uh, to uh, make sure that everybody knows that the ombudsman herself has not disappeared. She's, uh, she works in the Office of Communications and Community Outreach. So that, that position is actively engaged with stakeholders and um, and soliciting community input. Are you, are you saying that we could get our own sponsors back as an ombudsman and somebody who already knows how to ombud? <laughs> <laughs> because that would be fantastic. Uh, I'm we just, just saying have that to have position, position does exist. Yeah, but is it, why is it not called an ombudsman? It, it was restructured and defined that way because it's part of a broader, used to be a sort of a division, a per, an office of one, and now it's part of a group. So in all those places where like different state agencies and different things and you call them up on the phone and you say, I have this question and blah, 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 and they say, call your school system's ombudsman, there is literally, and then you try to find out who BCPS ombudsman is, there is literally no name that you're ever told. <coughs> well, I know you're talking about I like her, but I'm, what I'm saying is it would be nice if she had the title that was referred to all over the state as a person who does ombudsman things. Okay, we need to tighten this up in case anyone hasn't noticed it's very late. Um, the ombudsman, which the question I asked and the answer was lovely given in the printed response, was had specific responsibilities reported to the board um, and it was clearly known to the board and to the community what it did. And that's what I am talking about having once again. Our engagement with our communities is only increasing as it should, as is helpful, and this will, this will help. Ms. Scott. So the ombudsman, <clears throat> so, so that I understand, the ombudsman that you're talking about, what is her official title if it's no longer ombudsman? And it's in the Office of Communications? I'll get that for you. Okay. The ombudsman that Kathleen is proposing talking about is an ombudsman who would report directly to the board. Okay, so in the interest of redundancy, I guess what I'm trying to understand is 
the job duties that the ombudsman does in the Office of Communications, how would that job duty differ for the board? Or would it be the same job except she would just work directly for the board doing the same thing that's already being done for the school system? If I may. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> the position is called executive liaison. We expanded it because this person not only deals with calls that come to the board office, but also to the community soups offices, communications offices, and she handles um, dozens of calls sometimes in a day. So, uh, Ms. Rowe, with all due respect, the term ombudsman is an old term. We're not really using that anymore. We're trying to broaden the understanding of what that position does. And so um, I think folks around the state, as you said, will begin to follow suit and change the name from, from ombudsman to uh, something similar to what we're doing, community engagement, community partnerships, things like that. Can you give a job description of what the ombudsman and or the we can executive liaison does? Yeah, just absolutely. right now, just like a five she overview. Literally, uh, for example, uh, people come to Greenwood to engage with us. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they're not always very happy. She's the first person they meet with um, to try to calm the situation down. Um, she takes phone calls, as I said, from all across the system, uh, from parents who want to talk to someone at central office. That's usually the first person they talk to. Okay. Um, so uh, she was the ombudsman for the school board, um, but we expanded the position so that she would um, have interaction with uh, various departments and, and also from the schools. So she works with the school board and also the school works, system? Really, she's uh, through the office of the superintendent um, is where her position really lives. Uh, but she works with communications, and uh, Tracy and Brenda use her as they need to. Um, I would also uh, say that um, we could utilize Tracy uh, better. So when board members get calls and things, rather than uh, forwarding them to uh, staff or, or trying to answer yourself, you could use Tracy, utilize her uh, in the same way that we utilize the ombudsman in the past. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Pester, then Ms. Mack. Okay, while Mr. Dickerson is there, it was my understanding from Mr. Baysmore that in addition to his government thing, he is also constituents services, et cetera. Now, I've been with him where he's gotten calls. He get and he just, his phone stays lit with people calling him about every issue that, for which we also get emails now. How does he fit and all of that fit together? Great question. Mr. Baysmore deals mostly with issues around um, legislative affairs or interacting with our county council and elected folks. But um, anyone who's been with Mr. Baysmore knows that he's um, got quite a reputation around the county for getting things done. And so, yes, people call Tony when they have questions about uh, which offices to call. Tony and uh, Carol used to work very closely together. She was his backup in Annapolis. She's no longer doing that. She's uh, doing some work with um, MSDE. But having said that, yes, Tony also um, fields questions from stakeholders. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mac, would it make sense just to move her back to the board? I guess I'll direct that to you, Kathleen, because I was, she, this, that position did not exist in the year I've been here. Well, and, that, and that's the point. There's, there is increased engagement with our community, as there should be. Board members have increased engagement around the school system. It was a position that worked very effectively reporting to the board. And this board has not had that in the past year. And I can tell you from channeling, trying to facilitate and coordinate the work of board members, there is a lot to do. And even now with uh, Tony, who is excellent, and, and, and Carol, who is excellent, and Tracy, who is excellent, I don't think any of them have an extra minute. I don't think our, our, you know, I don't think Ms. Gover has had a, a spare moment in the next year. So to say we can utilize her, I, I think is, is not a fair statement. I, I think that in order for this board to continue to improve our governance, to improve 
our accountability to our constituents, because as it is now, we have concerns that we've forwarded and we, and we haven't heard back how all of this is getting handled, and maybe it is getting handled, and that's great. But again, there's a piece where the board does not have that position for the community to understand that we are taking our community engagement seriously, we're taking consist constituent services seriously, um, and, and that we're really working to improve. Well, I'm, I'm not going to uh, debate oh. whether Ms. Gover is busy or not. I think we all know she is, but I would say that I think the board could do a better job of fielding those calls to Tracy, sending them to Tracy, and letting Tracy uh, send the calls out. I don't think that's happening now. I think Tracy would, would say that if she were being honest. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying if we utilize Tracy to take the calls that you all get and then have Tracy send those out to uh, Ms. Betoff uh, and the various offices, I think you probably get the same bang you're trying to, trying to get out of um, an ombudsman position that, I'll say it again, already exists. Well, actually, and if we, I could, excuse me, we oh. just, just to that point, Dr. Williams has requested that the board forward everything to the office of attendance. So that's the communication protocol that we're following. And certainly there's room for improvement, but we, we can't ask people that are already doing tremendous jobs to do more. And that's part of what we hear from our teachers and, and from <coughs> everybody else. We need to be realistic about the work. <coughs> Yeah, and I understand that, and also because um, we also talk about being fiscally conservative, and so it looks like it's an additional 350, roughly 350,000, 349,000 for it sounds like a position that that no. may already exist or be redundant. No budget impact. It's no budget impact. It's potentially no budget impact because really? we have had a vacant chief communications officer position for two years. It's an FTE that would be reallocated. Okay, and then my other question is, is it, it, you said two positions, uh, an ombudsman, um, but when was the ombudsman position no longer existing where the position reported directly to the board? When did that end? Not in my time, I, you know. So in excess of 14 years at least. 14 years ago? It's, all, it's been a superintendent position. So like like 2000. Oh, 2013. The document that's on the that was returned with the answers had a 2011 description of the ombudsman reporting to the board. Okay. Okay, so it was changed around 2011-ish. Um, and so what you're talking about? 2013. 2013. Okay, so there's some discrep discrepancy there. So what you're talking about, Kathleen, are two positions: an executive. Well, we already have an executive assistant. You're talking about a chief executive officer and staff. a chief of staff that would report directly to the board and then an ombudsman. Who would hire these and interview for these positions? Would these be existing staff members that would be reallocated to the board or would we hire and who would do that hiring? Would it be the, the board that would interview and hire that position as a whole? We could do that. We're doing that currently with our ethics review panel. So, so I, I guess that's what I'm just saying, like hiring. who would decide we who? Can, we can work on the process because it would start July 1, so we would have time to work on the process. Okay. Board. All right, that's interesting. And has this board ever had a chief of staff that reported directly to the board? No. No, so this would be new. had elected. Board no, I know. I, I guess I'm just. The, it's just a, it, the population is growing. So. Population is growing, and we have a we have a full staff here. I, I guess I'm just trying to to reconcile having redundant positions. That's the only thing. Putting out large sums of money for positions that already exist, when maybe we could redirect the work of those already existing positions. Ms. Pasture. Okay. I it's too late to have a description of what that person would do, and I wish we'd had this discussion before we got to this point. Um, I just would like, as a board member, to have a discussion about what exactly we want this person to do, a chief of staff of the board. Um, just. Hmm. 
Who seconded me because I'm thinking of modifying my motion? Okay. Um, I, well, the the job description for the ombudsman was in the answers that were given as part of the work session in the budget, so they were online. Um, so I'm going to modify my I'm going to modify my um, proposal. So I move to amend the proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 by increasing the Board of Education. Well, actually, I'm not going to increase. Um, I'm going to withdraw my motion. Okay, that I won't. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to vote to uh, modify my amendment. I move to amend the proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 by uh, restoring a 1.0 professional FTE position for ombudsman to respond to BCPS st stakeholders. And I'm saying that it's fiscally neutral because it can um, take the place of the vacant chief of communications officer position. Will you accept that? Yes. So my question is, salary-wise, the vacant chief communications officer position is closer to the chief of staff position than the ombudsman position. So when you're talking about a salary, a, a new, net neutral impact on the budget, I thought you were making the motion that those two positions would be yes. replaced, not the ombudsman, which had an impact of... 149, I believe. Yes. So what so I this would not support that. Well, what <coughs> this would do is it would actually reduce the budget. We would get the board would get the ombudsman that it already has ha had for years, where the job description is already in the in the uh, board answers, and I'm what I'm saying is I'm not requesting the chief of staff because as Ms. Pasture okay. pointed out we haven't flushed out a whole job. Um, okay, then I would support that. Okay. Dr. Williams? May I just suggest that um, you just make the recommendation for an additional FTE to support um, the, the Office of the Board of Education. I've had some thoughts about what to do with that vacant position called the Chief of Communication, not to have another chief but to look at some other means of, of using that to provide support to schools. So I would just recommend that you modify that to say there's a need to have an additional FTE um, ombudsman in the office of the Board of Education. Okay, so I'm going to modify my motion. I move to, and Tracy, I'll have this for you. I move to amend the proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 by increasing the Board of Education salaries and wages budget by 149,000 for the restoration of a 1.0 professional FTE position for an ombudsman to respond to BCPS stakeholders to report to the board. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, board members, we had one issue that we tabled. Is there any other issue before we go back to the one tabled issue? Okay. Uh, the issue that was tabled, at, excuse me, that was postponed and is now being recalled is the issue of the 15 minutes. And um, the. Would you like me to reread it? There is the motion, yes. Um, I move that BCPS add 15 million to this budget to provide the school system with funding flexibility to negotiate with bargaining units for adding between 10 and 15 minutes to the school day. So the discussion that we had earlier related to Dr. Williams, um, issue, valid issue with the task of planning and the contingency of funding. 
and we had left it with a question of is there a way to try and have master agreement negotiation before we do the February 25th meeting? Yes. So the last time that we put the 15 minutes in the budget, we didn't have everything figured out and the budget was contingent and it didn't get funded and then we had to change things because it didn't get funded. So had it been funded, we would have been adding 15 minutes with just the same amount of time, point, time frame as we're doing it in this situation and staff recommendation was okay with that when we did it last year. So how is this year different other than the fact that it's a negotiating year which should give us more ability to need that in the budget? That's a good question that I don't have an answer for. Well, Does I was just responding to that 10 day uh, component of the motion, okay. really, what which do doesn't, I don't think it's, is it still in the motion? She has a motion that we haven't voted on. Oh, so okay. we're discussing. And it's 1 a.m. So we're down to nine days. May I speak to that? Okay. Ms. Hen. So I think maybe, and maybe due to the hour, we may be unnecessarily conflating what we include in the amendment in the budget with the negotiations. And by that, I mean the two may be independent of one another in that we can include what we want and regardless of how the negotiations go, it's in there. So I would continue to support Ms. Rowe's motion and with the confidence that it's in there because that's the will of the board if that's the way this goes. So regardless of how negotiations go. And if it's cut like it did was last time, it's cut. But we need to ask for what we want. Any other discussion board members? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Board members, any other discussions? Um, I just want to um, appreciate staff, Dr. Williams. This has been um, the most robust budget cycle and certainly a very robust meeting. We do have we <clears throat> we're supposed to have the next item on the agenda is board member comments. I'm going to postpone those until um, the next meeting, if that is uh, fine with all of the board members. Everyone fine with postponing the board member comments? Please raise your hand because we're adjusting the agenda. Thank you. The next item on the agenda. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is item R, information. And the last item on the agenda is announcements. Next board meeting, Tuesday, February 25th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. We're also having Board of Education public hearing on the Pleasant Plains Elementary School Capacity Relief Boundary recommendation, which is Wednesday, February 26, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. at Lock Raven High School Auditorium. Sign up begins at 5.30. All who sign up will be able to speak. Thank you all for this great work. The meeting is adjourned.